It is election night in the Illinois. Good evening, everyone. The polls are closed. We are underway. Welcome to the Illinois. I'm Patrick Fingston. I write the Illinois political newsletter at theillinois.com. We are so thankful that you're here tonight. Uh, as uh, you can tell, I'm not a television or video professional and had my collar all popped up behind me. Uh, we are uh, excited to have you here tonight. Uh, we have a, a really, uh, really exciting show interesting show for you throughout the next likely four hours or so uh, we have a star-studded lineup of panelists that are going to join us throughout the night to give their opinions and insights as to what they're seeing throughout the state uh, as we uh, as we see the results of this uh, odd slightly quiet primary I was talking to someone in Southern Illinois today who, who was telling me that it felt like a a municipal primary that that there there were few things going on and not a lot of people out to vote and we're seeing that reflected throughout the state uh, as as we look at uh, you know voter turnout that is expected to be uh, incredibly low. And, and that's, uh, that's going to be the name of the game and probably the, the narrative of our discussion throughout the night is, is what's, what's likely to happen. So, so here's how, here's how things are going to go. We are, uh, excited to have a great group of nerds working with us tonight, uh, to input data from around the state, uh, as quickly as we can receive it. And as quickly as we can get it in. And we are going to be focusing on a lot of big races throughout the state. Let's run through a few of them for you as we hit the 7 o'clock hour. Uh, I have not seen any calls from the Associated Press yet, but uh, it is likely that we'll see... Uh, We'll likely see uh, Illinois called for Joe Biden and Donald Trump uh, immediately after the polls close, uh, if not immediately, very shortly thereafter. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll then see uh, what else we get into uh, as as the, the night goes on. So this is kind of what our format's going to look like uh, through through the evening. And, you know, it's it's uh, a a really uh, there's a lot of races we're going to be covering throughout the course of the night. We're going to start with the big one, which is the 12th congressional district primary. This is the race between Mike Post, the the five term incumbent from Murfreesboro, uh, former Marine, former truck driver, former uh, Illinois state representative who uh, vaulted into uh, Congress in 2014. Uh, has essentially been a, a pretty straightforward conservative vote uh, in his time in Congress. Enter Darren Bailey, uh, the 2022 uh, Republican nominee for governor in our state, has uh, challenged Bost. Uh, Bailey staked his campaign on the uh, on on the the Trump endorsement. He he is uh, essentially running as the proto Trump. And uh, is it going to work? We don't know. Trump endorsed Bost, but we don't know if that endorsement is going to have the same uh, impact that we maybe thought it would at the start of the race. The fourth congressional district in the city of Chicago, incumbent Jesus Chewy Garcia, is being challenged by uh, Chicago Alderman Raymond Lopez. Uh, Garcia is expected to win this race. There was some uh, funny business in the the city today as there were charges of uh, Lopez handing envelopes of cash to election judges, uh, or at least workers for Lopez. Apparently, it's a long-standing Southside tradition of uh, ward committeemen uh, paying for lunch for election workers. Uh, so, so we'll see if anything comes of that. But of course, it was a little bit of drama uh, as we uh kicked off our our uh, our day uh earlier earlier today 
the sixth congressional district. This is incumbent Sean Caston, the Democrat from uh, Downers Grove. He's being challenged from the left by Manur Ahmad, a public health advocate, uh, also a union operator, uh, Charles Hughes in that race. Uh, the the question, and, and we'll get into this on the, the 6th and the 11th as well, is, is what did the challenges from the left do uh, to, to incumbent members like Sean Caston and Bill Foster? Does it show maybe a more... Uh, a, a more of a trend leftward for, for Democrats? We'll see. The 7th Congressional District, this is one that we thought would be one of the more hotly contested races in the state. It's turned out to be a little bit quiet, uh, sort of, at least until the last couple of days. Uh, incumbent Danny Davis from Chicago, he faces a challenge from Chicago City Treasurer Melissa Conyers Irvin, uh, progressive advocate Kenna Collins, former Pritzker aide Corey Marshall, and Nikhil Bata. Uh, that, uh, you know, I think conventional wisdom told you Davis was going to win that race, but who knows in the final weeks, or at least in the final hours before we got there. The 11th congressional district, which stretches from essentially Wisconsin to Joliet. Uh, incumbent Bill Foster from Naperville faces a challenge from the left from human rights lawyer Qasem Rashid. Uh, Rashid has been running significantly to the left of Foster, who's who's no conservative by any means. So, so again, that will be a barometer of where Republicans stand or Democrats stand in, in terms of uh, their race. The 11th Congressional District as well has a Republican primary. All three of these kind of seen as sacrificial lambs in the fall, uh, unless one can catch fire. Uh, Jerry Evans owns a music store. Uh, he is kind of expected to be uh, the Republican nominee uh, as things likely take off uh, for him. Uh, and we'll see if he can run any sort of a campaign, uh, likely in a world where Donald Trump is uh, the Republican nominee and probably loses Illinois by a million votes again. The 17th Congressional District, two Republicans facing off to face incumbent uh, uh, Eric Sorensen in uh, November. Uh, that is former Winnebago County Judge Joe McGraw, who recently retired. He's facing Scott Crowell, a uh, farmer from uh, the Quad Cities area. In the state Senate, uh, there are a handful of races that we're keeping an eye on. The 19th Senate Republican primary uh, is to uh, is between three to face off against uh Mike Hastings, the Democrat from uh, Frankfurt, uh, who was targeted for defeat by Republicans last year, uh, and uh, they could not take him out last year. He's back on board with Senate Democrats. We'll see uh, if Republicans can mount a uh, real challenge to him in November. The 20th Senate District is one that's getting a ton of attention here in the Chicago area. Appointed incumbent Natalie Toro uh, has received more than $2 million from uh, Senate President uh, Don Harmon and his organization. She's expected to lose tonight. Uh, to progressive uh, Graciela Guzman, who had the support of basically every progressive institution there is, including the Chicago Teachers Union. Uh, Dr. Dave Nyack could make that race interesting as well. A couple of open seats in the Senate in downstate Illinois. Uh, the first is the 37th district, which runs essentially from the Quad Cities all the way down to Peoria. Uh, Lee Ariano, the former mayor of Dixon, faces Chris Bishop, a Dixon alderman, and Tim Yeager, a member of the Henry County Board, to replace uh, Wynn Stoller, who is not seeking re-election. Uh, Patrick Joyce, a Democratic senator from Essex near Kankakee, has a uh, marginal challenge tonight. 53rd Senate District is a Republican primary. It is expected to be uh, potentially very close. Grundy County Board Chairman Chris Balkema uh, is uh, challenged mostly by uh, Pontiac High School agriculture teacher and farmer Jesse Faber, uh, former Livingston County Board member Mike Kirkton, and former Iroquois County Board member Susan Wynn Bentz uh, are both in that race as well. And then there's the 58th Senate District in Southern Illinois, where we thought uh, State Senator Terry Bryant, who had previously voted for some tax increases and had a little bit of hot water with conservatives, uh, would be in trouble. Uh, the right found the wrong candidate. Uh, Wesley Cash uh, has run a very strange campaign, uh, even though he's had uh, quite a bit of money behind him. Uh, it is expected that Bryant wins uh, and doesn't only win, but wins big uh, tonight. We'll we'll quickly run through these House races. Uh, Lillian Jimenez, a Democrat from Chicago, has a primary, as does uh, in appointed incumbent uh, Kimberly Dubuclay. 
Uh, Sonia Harper has a challenge. These these three are not expected to be super cl close races, but we'll keep an eye, of course. The 21st House District, Abdul Nasser Rashid, who uh, kind of surprised folks when he uh, beat uh, former Representative Mike Zaleski two years ago. Uh, he faces an incumbent from for, or a, a challenge from former uh, Chicago Police Sergeant Vidal Vasquez. Uh, that is a majority Hispanic uh, Latino uh, district at this point. So it will be interesting to see how how that one plays out. Uh, Angie Guerrero Cuellar, who uh, sort of replaced uh, House Speaker Michael Madigan, former Madigan, uh, former Speaker Madigan in the House. Uh, there was a little bit of a a wave to get there, but uh, she faces a, a two way challenge. But she's expected to survive tonight. Edgar Gonzalez, uh, one of the youngest members of the, the House, has a uh, challenge from another young man uh, named Joseph Mercado. Uh, not really expecting huge uh, a huge race there, but uh, obviously we'll keep our eyes. Uh, Teresa Ma faces a uh, challenge from uh, Lai Ching Eng, uh, who's backed by uh, uh, an alderman, uh, Cardenas, uh, in, uh, in Chicago, as, as there's kind of a battle for committee. Uh, person in between Ma and Cardenas as well, uh, and and we get into that um, uh, that that fight over uh, over that seat, uh, kind of on the near south side. Justin Slaughter has a challenge from Teacher Tawana Robinson. Thaddeus Jones, the mayor of Calumet City, is uh, facing a challenge as well from Gloria White. The 31st House District is one that we have been paying close attention to throughout the last few months. Mary Flowers, the near 40-year incumbent of the House of Representatives, uh, is in the fight for her political life at the hands of House Speaker Michael Madigan. Uh, he, uh, or, sorry, House Speaker Chris Welch. He uh, has essentially put together $2 million in funding to help defeat Flowers. Uh, the preferred choice is Michael Crawford, a dean at the Chicago School, which is kind of a, a psychology, behavioral sciences college in, in the city. Flowers is an institution uh, on the South Side, so we'll see if she can survive. Appointed incumbent Mary Gill has a uh, challenger, hasn't raised any money. Another big one is the uh, race to replace outgoing uh, State Representative Kelly Burke. Her choice is Rick Ryan, a, uh, an attorney from Evergreen Park. He's challenged from the left by Sonia Khalil, uh, whose family is heavily involved in Arab American politics uh, down in the South suburbs. Uh, Khalil actually went on broadcast TV uh, in the last few days. So and there's been a ton of money pumped into that race as well. So we'll keep an eye on, on that one. Uh, marginal House primary, Hannah Billingsley is kind of the Republican choice to take on uh, Representative Maura Hershauer in the fall. We'll see how that one shakes out. The 76th House District, the Democratic primary is to replace uh, outgoing Representative Lance Yednock. Uh, the three-way race is DeKalb Mayor Cohen Barnes, uh, former uh, Yednock staffer Amy Murray Briel and uh, Carolyn Zasada, who is a member of the DeKalb City Council. There's a Republican primary as well. The House Republican uh, campaign arm is behind Liz Bishop. Uh, she's kind of getting a challenge from the right from uh, Crystal Lofgren of Peru. The 79th House District, four Democrats facing off to take on uh uh, Republican Jackie Haas in November. Uh, Billy Morgan, a former aide to then Governor Pat Quinn, uh, is uh, in the race. So is Geneva Walters, the uh, Kankakee School Superintendent. The expectation here was this was Walters who was uh, recruited to to run for the seat. Uh, Morgan got in and has run a really good campaign. I, I would expect Morgan to win that race tonight. The 83rd House District, uh, Matt Hansen, a uh, Former Union train operator, uh, he is he has a challenge from a 22 year old named Arad Boxenbaum. Hansen has a ton of money, should be fine. Has a little baggage though because he uh, got uh, pinned for a DUI last year. The 88th House District to replace outgoing uh, Representative Dan Calkins, Regan Deering, who ran for Congress in 2022 and is the uh, heir to the uh, ADM connected Andreas family. Uh, she faces uh, McLean County Board Chair uh, Member Chuck Erickson. Uh, this is a heavily Bloomington district, even though uh, Dan Calkins from Decatur represents it. Will be interesting to see how the geography plays out in this one. 99th House District, former Quincy Mayor Kyle Moore expected to win that race. The 102nd District is completely goofy. 
Uh, it's a two-way write-in race between Adam Niemerg, the incumbent from Dietrich, who got kicked off the ballot uh, for messing up his petitions. He faces uh, Jim Acklin, a former uh, school superintendent in St. Joe, who's currently in uh, uh, Chrisman in Champaign and Edgar counties. Uh, we're not expected to have any numbers of serious nature in this tonight. It could be days or even weeks uh, before we know who's going to win that race. Uh, incumbent uh, Dennis Tipsard from Metamora has a uh, marginal challenge. Brad Hallbrook from Shelbyville has a challenger. Blaine Wilhauer has a union-funded opponent in Matt Hall. And then uh, the 116th district in Southern Illinois has a uh, two-way race between incumbent Dave Severin and Angela Hall, a member of the Franklin County Board. So those are the races we're watching tonight. Uh, we, we obviously won't be, uh, rolling through each and every one of them, uh, as, as they, as they pop on. Uh, but we will be, uh, we will be certainly, uh, paying attention to those races as we, uh, move on throughout the night. So let's bring in our first group of, uh, guests this evening. We're pleased to welcome Bill Enyard, a former major general in the United States Army and served as a member of Congress from 2013 to 2015. Uh, also was the adjutant general of the Illinois National Guard. Uh, he uh, actually has the distinction of being the guy Mike Boss beat uh, in 2014. So uh, you, you're well versed in Mike Boss and uh, sorry to open any old wounds there, there Congressman. But uh, And then uh, for a guy who spent his life serving, we go to a guy who spends his life in politics, Colin Corbett, uh, our good friend of Core Strategies uh, in the Chicago suburbs, uh, also the host of the Smoke Filled Room podcast, and a guy who's about to be a daddy here in like 48 hours. So uh, Yeah, no, nowhere near as many impressive titles as your other guests, but at least I'll get daddy in a couple of days. That's the most important one, I think Bill would agree. So, gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for kicking off our, our coverage tonight. Uh, this is uh, – election night is always exciting when, when you're nerds like this. Uh, Bill, I want to start with you in southern Illinois. Obviously, you uh, – I, I think you're probably in the 13th now after uh, after the, the gerrymandering gave Nikki Budzinski a bunch of St. Clair County. But Lord knows you've got your eyes and you can't you – can't you can't look without hearing something about the 12th district race from the left. What's your perspective on, uh, on this race, uh, as we, as we go into the evening? Well, thanks to, thanks for inviting me this evening, Patrick, and it's great to be with you. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, that, uh, Boss is going to run very, very well in, in his uh, home areas down around Carbondale. Uh, he's, he uh, was a state legislator there and, and, uh, has uh, uh, always run well there. Um, and of course, uh, Bailey's going to run well uh, up in the northern part of that district. You know, that district is huge. Uh, the, the old 12th was 12 counties, 11 and, and part of Madison, actually. Uh, whereas this is now, what, 34? 34, 34. I think. 34. 34 counties. Oh my God, it runs all the way from Caro to uh, up past Champaign. Matt and Charleston. Yeah, it's Matt. It's, yeah, Charleston. It's, it's, okay. It's it's Paducah to Charleston. Paducah to Charleston. That is one huge piece of territory. The old 12th was about the size of the state of Connecticut. I I haven't looked it up to see how big this one is, but it it's at a very split up media market. Uh, luckily, you've got a lot of smaller media markets, but I don't know that they've been up on TV a whole lot. I, I, I know uh, they've been up a little bit. Yeah, Boston, Boston has been up on TV since January 3rd, un, essentially untouched until the last few weeks. But he was concentrated in that Carbondale, Paducah, Cape Girardeau market. And and I don't think ever bought any broadcast in St. Louis or Champaign. So it was really focused on that southern part. Yeah, we haven't seen any in St. Louis, that's for sure. And I, I doubt that Boston is very well known once you get up out of the old 12th. Once you get up past Mount Vernon, uh, I, I don't... Uh, I don't think he's very well known. So he's going to have a hill to climb there. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, if you think uh, signs uh, win elections, uh, uh, I've seen a lot of Bailey signs here, but uh, the boss signs just started coming out of uh, uh, people's closets here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and interestingly enough, in Randolph County, I drove past the Randolph County Republican headquarters yet, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they had a boss sign and a Bailey sign. So I'm not sure if they uh, were, were splitting their bets, uh, although most of the signage in, in uh, Randolph County seems to be boss now. 
So let's uh, let's bring Colin in here. Uh, Colin, uh, the the Republican perspective here, I think, you know, we talked about this on on your podcast months ago now was was that whoever Trump endorsed in this race was likely got the golden goose and was good to go. Seems like this race is really close, even though Bost got that endorsement. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I, I mean, let's let's see what the results say in not that long from now. Uh, simply because this always happens. We always forget, like, you know, people like you and me, we really need things to be interesting. So people will watch our podcasts and read the stuff that we put out. So we glom on to the fact that everything, you know, the race is tightening, but in the history of politics, every race tightens up until election day, and then it tightens until it doesn't. So I want to see the actual results. Of course, it could go, as you said in your newsletter, it could go one of two ways. It could be tight, or maybe all these, all these people worrying about how it's tight ends up, you know, it's at eight or 9%. So I'd like to see the results uh, before we sort of overreact on uh, was it tight or was it not. But I mean, Trump's endorsement did have an impact. Uh, keep in mind, again, that a lot of what um, boss strategy was in this race was keeping Bailey from catching up. This was a much different race than, let's say, Davis Miller, where there were a bunch of undecideds and each candidate was trying to grow and only one candidate was able to do so. In this case, it was an entire strategy based on, hey, listen, I'm bossed. I'm starting in the lead and I just need to keep Bailey from gaining ground. And so it's a different race with a different strategy. And really, it was just all about keeping a ceiling there for Bailey so he could never cross that 50 percent threshold. So, gentlemen, as of 715, the Associated Press has called Illinois for Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Uh, no surprise, of course. Uh, and uh, Biden, of course, was was all set in the delegate count anyway, because he never had any uh, any challengers uh, via uh, uh, via delegates. Uh, the the Republican race, we would expect Trump's delegates will, will do the best. But uh, that shapes us up at a uh, as a. Uh, race to November between uh, the two candidates we thought would be there. And uh, Bill, I want to start with you. It, it looks like, you know, another uh, race, uh, another statewide race for, for Democrats in Illinois, where, uh, where Joe Biden is, is likely to, to win Illinois big and, and uh, is from a Democrat perspective, I assume a Biden supporter, uh, is, is he the guy that can win in November? Well, you know, I was an early endorser for Biden back in uh, 2000 and actually flew out to New Hampshire in, in November uh, uh, prior to uh, uh, prior to the election, uh, prior to the primary here and, and campaigned for Joe. Uh, and then it was a few weeks later that he, he carried South Carolina and really broke out of the pack. Uh, absolutely, I'm, I'm supporting Biden. Uh, he's got uh, he's got the experience. Uh, I think the State of the Union uh, address showed that uh, uh, in spite of the uh, propaganda that's coming out of the right wing uh, mills, uh, that that he's uh, certainly uh, retained every edge and and uh, is, is sharp. Uh, frankly, I think uh, uh, all, all of this attacks about his age are, are ageism. You know, you, you certainly wouldn't talk about a woman that way. You certainly wouldn't want to talk about a, a person of color that way. Uh, but it's okay to talk bad about old people because they're old. Uh, Joe's a very, very sharp guy. I've known him personally for 15 years, and uh, uh, I like Jill better. Uh, uh, I'd vote for Jill in a heartbeat, too. But uh, I, I think Joe is capable of doing the job, and I, I think he's going to win. I think, you know, Trump has just got too much baggage. Uh, and uh, he's got his very, very hardcore that, that love him and, and would lay down their lives for him. But, uh, you know, when you can only get uh, when you can when you've got 40 of your cabinet members who refuse to endorse you, when your vice president refuses to endorse you, I, I think that's got to got to got to give a message. Uh, Colin, you're shaking your head. Is it is it fair to to question Biden's age? Yeah, I mean, this this comparing age to gender or race is crazy. Uh, you, you don't you don't say because somebody is a specific gender or race, they might be held back. But when you look at the fact that um, Biden is clearly diminished in his mental capacity, that that's we shouldn't talk about that just because he happens to be older. That's ridiculous. If he's an, even SN, an SNL is making fun of you, you know, it's pretty bad. So let's stick to the facts rather than just defending the guy because he happens to be from our tribe or from our party. Uh, listen, nobody's excited 
excited about these two general election candidates. Let's not pretend like either one is a world beater. The general election is going to be the lowest turnout we've seen in a very, very long time. But to pretend like Biden is this great candidate uh, and Republicans are being held back by our nominee is not in, a, in any way true. No data supports that. Nobody likes either of these candidates. So let's be honest about that fact. Nobody likes Biden. Uh, independents are not happy with Biden. Even Democrats are not happy with Biden. Uh, and so, you know, you're going to see a lot of candidates running away from the top of the ticket because, frankly, both sides are probably going to be a drag in most uh, targeted districts. Bill, uh, re Democrats have struggled in a lot of Southern Illinois uh, in, in recent years. We've talked about this in the past. Uh, the The condition of our politics today probably doesn't make that any better for for Democrats downstate this year. Um, uh, obviously some, you know, we've, we've talked about the Budzinski district too, that was very nicely gerrymandered to elect a Democrat. Uh, but you've got a lot of legislative races that are tough. Latoya Greenwood lost a race last year that she probably shouldn't have lost. Um, you know, the, the, the John Bradley and Brandon Phelps and those sort of, of, of Southern Illinois Democrats in the, the legislature are gone. How do you all, uh, gain a foothold again downstate? Well, you know, I think um, there, there's been a remarkable shift in, in downstate Illinois, uh, uh, certainly away from the National Democratic Party. And I, I think um, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think a lot of that has to do with coal mining, with the fact that this was old coal mining country. And, and we had a lot of the, the uh, older folks who uh, were union uh, coal miners, and those those people are all gone. And they, uh, but they still uh, have this uh, vision that coal mining is going to return. Of course, it's not going to return. Um, uh, although there's a lot of a lot of coal being mined, it's it's being shipped overseas. So, uh, and and it's dropped to less and less part of our energy portfolio. Uh, I I think that the um, the Democratic Party in, in deep Southern Illinois, once you get outside the Metro East, and even in Madison County uh, where is, is having some problems, I think uh, it has to be rebuilt from the ground up. And they're going to have to build a bench and start running folks for county board and county sheriff and, and uh, so on. We, uh, but all of those old line uh, uh, Democrats that you mentioned, uh, uh, like John Bradley and so on, those are all gone. But, you know, I think that maybe one way the Democratic Party could sell itself down here would be uh, let's look back to the old days. You know, Southern Illinois uh, was doing great when we had folks like Kenny Gray and, uh, uh, and Paul Powell and some of those other uh, old names from. And let's how, not much, how much money boxes. in a shoe? Let's not talk about shoe boxes. <laughs> uh, but but the point of the fact is that they brought uh, they brought things to Southern Illinois and they could. They could work deals uh, together with the Chicago Democrats because Chicago Democrats needed them, uh, you know, and it was the it was the Southern Illinois old line conservative Democrats aligning with the Chicago area Democrats to outvote the central Illinois Republicans. And that that whole dynamic is now gone. Uh, and, and Colin, before before we let you guys go, uh, relatively the same question for you in terms of. Republicans in the suburbs and, and Trump losing Illinois by a million votes again, we would expect maybe more. Uh, how do Republicans overcome uh, what is likely to be a drag on the ticket, especially north of I-80? Yeah, uh, we're seeing in a lot of our polling right now and a lot of the data that we're, we're putting out there that there are a lot of policies that voters are passionately um, supporting conservative positions on. They don't like our personalities, as you mentioned. A lot of voters in the suburbs don't like the top of the ticket and the personalities of somebody like a Trump. But when you take that away, uh, they align with a majority of Republican positions. And so what the Republican Party needs to do um, is make this more about who's which, which, um, which plan, if you will, is better for Americans, which elected officials at the local level, at the state level, is going to be better for the people of the state, who can make more of a difference on kitchen table issues. Uh, because when you look at those issues throughout the state of Illinois, you look at uh, Democrats and their pro-crime agenda in this state, you look at Democrats and their tax and spend addiction in this state, you look at Democrats and the fact that they've made uh, inflation worse, not better, the cost of living worse, not better. As Congressman Enyart just talked about uh, how Democrats are not the party of 
of, of working families anymore like they maybe used to be. You know, the Republicans have a great opportunity to step into the space. Yeah, we need better personalities, but guess what? That ju- that's done. The, the primary is over. We're locked with the candidates. Buddy, there's a have. difference between personalities and somebody wanting to overthrow Congress. I mean, it's it's just like or overturn the results of an election. It, it goes so much deeper than personality. Yeah, well, either way, the point is that policy on policy, voters are with us. So whether you agree or disagree with Republicans' ability to step away from that problematic personality, my point is, is that we need to. Uh, And so I think that's the point we can agree on, is that we need to focus on those areas that we align with those voters rather than getting stuck in a national debate and rather than fighting over which presidential candidate is worse, because that's just a race to the bottom. All right, gentlemen, we'll leave it at that. Congressman Bill Enyart, uh, former general as well, adjutant general of the Illinois National Guard uh, on his uh, distinguished resume, and our friend Colin Corbett, uh, political uh, strategist and uh, soon-to-be papa. Uh, Colin, congratulations. We're, we're, our thoughts are with you and Abby over the next couple of days, and uh, uh, we're, we're excited to hear some good news on your end. And, and Bill, as always, thanks for, for your time and, and friendship as well. Good to be with you, Patrick. All right. That's our that's our first group for the night. We're going to have good conversations and good debates on on issues like that throughout the night. That's what we're here to do. Uh, I, I, I'm not bringing jerks on this show, you know, and, and I, I fully expect uh, these these folks to disagree. And 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 that's a good thing because that's what our system is about. And, and so we're going to keep uh, we're going to keep bringing folks in uh, through through the night uh, and have a lot of good conversations. So we do have a few uh, results that we want to give you uh, early. Of course, uh, these are likely just uh, early and absentee ballots that we're seeing in uh, the 12th congressional district. Uh, so so again, don't take this as um, as 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 doctrine or as, as anything, uh, super serious, because these are just the, the first numbers that we're seeing, uh, bossed with a, uh, 1200 to 300 vote lead over Bailey. Uh, again, very early, 0% of precincts reporting. These are, uh, likely just early and absentee ballots, uh, that are being, uh, counted, uh, within the, uh, sixth or the 12th congressional district. I don't know that we have much else. Let me run through the list real quick. Uh, Terry Bryant, again, early in absentee ballots in Southern Illinois, uh, leaning over Wesley Cash, 277 to 44. And in the House, nothing there yet. Uh, a couple of uh, early in absentees in the 35th, Mary Gill over David Dewar, uh, Mary Flowers losing uh, early to... Uh, Michael Crawford, uh, again, so there's actually a couple of precincts reporting in that one. Uh, so that's a uh, 350 to 160 uh, race thus far. And Justin Slaughter leads early. Uh, Teresa Ma leads early. That, of course, is uh, uh, th- that number is probably not quite right. We'll double check that. Edgar Gonzalez leads early. Uh, Angie Guerrero Cuellar uh, leads early as well over her uh, two challengers. Uh, Sonia Harper leads. Kim Dubuque leads. Uh, Lillian Jimenez leads. I, I, I would keep an eye on the Jimenez race. Uh, Ortiz is a uh, uh, county sheriff's deputy, uh, has uh, previously been on the ballot uh, as a uh, – has, has apparently been working the, the 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 streets pretty hard, so so we'll see how uh, how that one uh, shakes out through the night. But uh, again, these are all very early. Uh, the ones to to note uh, as we uh, get started uh, are the Flowers race, where she's down uh, with these first few ballots out, uh, and then the Crawford uh, or the Mary Flowers race, where she's down early. And then the uh, Terry Bryant race, where Bryant is leading uh, early. And then we also have uh, just very early on in the 12th congressional district, uh, early in absentee ballots, heavily for boss. Uh, that's not a surprise, I would say, by any means, uh, that that boss would have a, uh, a, a lead uh, among early and absentee voters, because essentially uh, that's you know the the Bailey crowd uh if you want to if you want to go there the Bailey crowd are the, are the folks that have been uh the uh are, are the folks that have been 
uh, skeptical of early votes, have been skeptical of mail-in ballots. You know, they're the people that 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 have gotten behind Donald Trump's claims that they're all corrupt, uh, essentially. Uh, so, so it's uh, um, not a surprise that early and absentee are going to go big for for Boston. Uh, we'll, we'll be, uh, you know, we mentioned early, uh, these races that we'll be keeping an eye on through the night and they're, you know, just, we kind of did a quick brush as we got started. Uh, we'll just kind of run through the list for the, uh, folks that are, uh, are joining us, uh, initially here, uh, and, uh, good evening to all those who, who are here. Uh, we're excited to have you. We're excited to try something new. Uh, and, and if you can see that, that in our, uh, our first conversation with uh, Congressman Enyard and our friend Colin Corbett that, you know, we're we're excited to put people who have differing views up to talk. And that's that's the that's the point of what we're doing tonight is to have a, lots of conversation from 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 lots of different sides. And, you know, we'll have some some diversity in our conversations as well. And uh, really looking forward to, to bringing you more conversations like that through the night. So just a, a quick rundown again of, of the races that we are watching tonight. Uh, the 12th congressional district, that is Mike Bost, uh, leading very early uh, over Darren Bailey. Uh, the 4th congressional district, this is Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia, facing Chicago Alderman Ray, Lo Ray Lopez. The 6th Congressional District is Sean Caston, the Democrat from Downers Grove, facing a challenge from the left from Manur Ahmad uh, and Charles Hughes, a union guy, uh, in that race as well. The 7th Congressional District is one we'll be keeping an eye on. Congressman Danny Davis, who is actually older than Joe Biden, uh, is uh, is seeking a 15th or 16th term in, in, in Congress. So he's uh, being challenged by Melissa Conyers Irvin, the Chicago City Treasurer. Tina Collins, a progressive activist, Corey Marshall, a former uh, Pritzker aide, uh, all in that race. We're, we're mostly keeping our eyes, though, on uh, Davis, Conyers Irvin, and Tina Collins in that race uh, as we as we wait for numbers to come in in that race. The 11th Congressional District incumbent Bill Foster, facing a challenge from the left from human rights lawyer Qasem Rashid, uh, nothing to report on that race. The Republicans in that race, music school uh, owner Jerry Evans, uh, and then Susan Hathaway Allman and Dr. Tim Mercado, all in that race. Uh, they will face off in November. That is a, uh, a uh, expected win for Democrats in November, but uh, the Republicans think in the right situation they could uh, make that a race. The 17th Congressional District uh, incumbent uh, Congressman Eric Sorensen, who uh, was elected two years ago, uh, he's unopposed in the Democratic primary. There is a Republican primary to face him in November. It is between recently retired Winnebago County Judge Joe McGraw uh, and a uh, farmer from the Rock Island area uh, named Scott Crowell. Uh, the expectation, again, McGraw is the Republican uh, that the establishment is backing. Uh, Crowell's kind of gotten himself in some hot water, tried to position himself as a Trump guy. Uh, even though he wasn't necessarily, or he definitely wasn't endorsed. Uh, so it's been uh, an interesting way to uh, see that uh, one shake out. Uh, and as the uh, state Senate races uh, begin to to uh, trickle in, uh, just a couple of the big ones we're watching, the 20th uh, incumbent uh, Natalie Toro uh, is uh, in huge trouble, uh, is the expectation. Uh, Graciela Guzman has all of the uh, support from the left in the most liberal Senate district in the state. Uh, so uh, we'll see if, if Toro can manage to hold on thanks to $2 million of of uh, uh, Senate President Don Harmon's money. Uh, Dr. Dave Nyack has also spent a, a bunch of his own money in that race as well. 37th Senate district to replace outgoing Senator Wynn Stoller, former Dixon Mayor Lee Ariano, uh, Dixon City Council member Chris Bishop, and Henry County Board member Tim Yeager. Are in that race, another open Republican seat, the 53rd. Uh, this is uh, the seat that was held by Jason Barrickman, then Tom Bennett. Uh, it's open. Uh, it's likely a two-person race between Chris Balkema, the Grundy County Board Chairman, and Jesse Faber, a high school agriculture teacher and farmer uh, from Pontiac. And in the 58th Senate District, uh, incumbent Terry Bryant, uh, early lead, of course, all early and absentee ballots that were 
uh, seen uh, published uh, at this point early. Uh, she faces Weston Cash, who's uh, been been challenging her uh, from from the right. Panel, we ready? All right, let's bring in our next set of uh, wonderful folks to uh, to to join us this evening. Uh, we have uh, I'm I'm excited to bring in these two because they're they're two of my favorite recently recently retired members of Congress, uh, uh, former Congresswoman Sherry Bustos uh, from the Quad Cities area and former Congressman John Shimkus from Southern Illinois. Uh, Congressman, Congresswoman, good evening. Uh, thank you for taking time tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to have you both together because it shows that Republicans and Democrats who actually served in Congress together aren't always at each other's throats. <laughs> uh, Not at all. <laughs> so, so, uh, Congressman, if I could start with you, since since you're in Southern Illinois, uh, and and you're watching this box really race closely, I'm sure, uh, it, it the 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 thought was that Trump's endorsement in this race was was the golden goose, that that it was it was going to be what uh, set whoever got that endorsement over the top. Uh, it, it, it the end here it's it it looks like it's neck and neck between uh between boston and bailey why do you think it's it's well i i, I think i mean you're now an and you did some analysis or you you did some analysis earlier and i i think most of us are surprised that the trump endorsement didn't really expand the margin I think before the Trump endorsement, Mike was up five points. After the endorsement, he was up six points. It was interesting, and you know, in the uh, in the eastern southeastern part of the state, the Bailey area, there were people denying that Trump did the endorsement. And I think, I think what Mike tried to do, I think he tried to fight a campaign while being nice. And uh, so we'll see. I think Mike still wins. I think he's within the 5% margin. But as far as uh, really pulling away, I I don't think he did that. Congressman, what's your perspective as, as you've kind of looked at this race from 30,000 feet? You know, I, I, I can only imagine what a, a, a Democrat who represented a Trump district uh, would has to has to feel as you as you look at me, a member of Congress, uh, a guy who was a state senator, just fawn over this guy for an endorsement. I mean, how do you, how do you look at this race? Well, I'll, I'll look at it from the perspective that Mike Boss is a decent guy. Uh, I just ran into him in Washington last week, and I asked him how he felt about the race, and and he said that his polling showed that he was up. And, um, you know, and I told him, I said, congratulations on getting former President Trump's endorsement, because I know in a region like his and and John, that is, you know, that's your part of the state of Illinois, but um, that that mattered. And and look, Mike Boss is chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee. That's a really important committee. He's done a lot of good work. Um, I think he, if, if you remember the old, when they used to call him Meltdown Mike, um, when he, you know, he threw some papers when he was in the state legislature. Let my Democrats, people go. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, if you remember, the Democrats thought that was going to be his undoing. Um, and and it, all it did was was shore him up in the eyes of the, the voters down there. So, look, I, I will say this. I hope Mike Boss wins. Um, I, I'm a Democrat, but if I could have helped him. Um, it, it, you know, it's just kind of, it, it doesn't exactly go along quite along with my politics, but if I could have helped him, I would have, because I want, I want him to be reelected. I think he's an effective, uh, Congressman for Southern Illinois and, um, you know, we'll see how it ends up. I was glad to hear that he was up in the polls and again, back to John's, what, what he just said, we, you know, we'll see how it all shapes up, but we're, we're, uh, the, what the, the, did the polls just close what at seven? So seven o'clock. yeah. So we'll see in any early results in. Patrick? Uh, well, as luck would have it, I have this whole, uh, I have this whole fancy, uh, yeah, you are uh, like spreadsheet up that on things. Look at you. Up. Where are we? Um, my screen is being a little wonky. Stand by. Um, 
So you know, I, I will say this as you're looking, Patrick, and, and John, weigh in on this if, if you could, because again, you're I, I'm I'm originally from Cent from Springfield and the district I represented covered the entire northwest part of the state of Illinois. I do have family down in Carterville, so in that region. Um, but if if Trump had endorsed Bailey, I, I, I really do think that would have been bad for, for Congressman Bost. Um, and so I, that, that's why I told him I was glad that, that Trump endorsed him. Okay. So, well, yeah, so very early, these are early in yeah. absentee. So it's about 1400 early in absentee votes for Bost to 450 for Bailey. And I mentioned this before you guys jumped on that. It's, it's likely that, that Bost is going to do a lot better in early in absentee because Bailey is, is from that, that crowd that, that really said that early and absentee and mail-in ballots are, are inherently corrupt and that, that sort of thing. So uh, not a, not a big surprise early, but uh, likely not to see um, uh, some big numbers for a little while yet in that race. Any, any thoughts on what uh, the Congresswoman had to say, John? Well, no, I, I think she sure is right. I mean, I, I think there was a, a concerted effort to work real hard to make sure that the, that president Trump state, you know, supported Mike, or at least stayed neutral. Uh, had he weighed in on uh, 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 Darren Bailey's side, this this would have been a whole different story. You know, I, again, I think, I, you know, Southern Illinois has changed so much. I mean, sh you know, Sherry's from a political family. She knows, you know, deep Southern Illinois was, you know, this is uh, the Jerry Costello, the Glenn Prashard, the... Uh, uh, Kenny Gray area. Um, the transformation has just been crazy. And uh, the uh, I, I think that, you know, Mike, you know, Mike truly represents that area, but there's a new era in Republican partisan politics that that has that has changed our party. And it's 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 a challenging time for those who are what we call governing conservatives. That's what Mike is. You know, we, uh, we want to get 80 percent. We're Ronald Reagan people. We want to get 80 percent of the deal and then fight for the additional 20 versus, the you know, the burn it down faction that uh, that has arisen in, in my party. And it's, it's very disheartening. It's it's interesting that I mean you're you're almost parroting what Boss told me yesterday as I talked to him was was you know you've got to be a, a conservative that wants to govern and you can't burn the house down uh, and, and and I mean and as somebody on the other side Congresswoman that that worked with a guy like Boss my sense is that the Democrats who I think will take the majority next year uh, that's the kind of Republican you want to deal with isn't it. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I was a sponsor of a, a bill that I worked on for quite a while, and it had to go through the Veterans Affairs Committee. And so I was trying to 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 get support across the aisle. And this is when Democrats were in the majority. And But I wanted Mike Boss support on it. And to his credit, uh, he, he didn't want to support it. He, he wasn't planning to vote on it. But to his credit, he got back to me personally. He didn't ask a staff member to, oh, you know, give her the bad news. I'm, I don't, I don't want to get on this thing. But he had the decency to call me personally to tell me that he wasn't going to get on the bill and why he couldn't get on the bill. And so back to what, what John was just saying, kind of the old school way of politics um, in a good way. I Look, I, that's the kind of member of Congress I want to work with, whether it's a Democrat or Republican. And believe me, even on the Democratic side, you've got people who, you know, will, will be nice to your face, but stab you in the back. Um, in politics, never. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? But but I think Mike Boss is a little bit of an old school guy in 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 a good way, and that is that's why if I were still in office, I would consider him a friend. Um, I remember when I called him and told him um, that I was going to support the Democrat uh, who was running against him. Uh, it, it, this was a couple cycles ago. Um, all he said was, "You know, that, that's fine. I get that." And I told him, "I said I won't badmouth you." But I just want to let you know that I'm going to support the Democrat who's running down there. And he understood that that is just kind of the nature of politics. 
Um, I, I think that is a district that is lost to Democrats. I, you know, you never know forever. Oh, sure. you, you can't ever say forever, but I think it's lost to Democrats for at least the way, way, way foreseeable future. Well, I mean, the gerrymandering, the, the, it's not the Jerry Costello district. Anymore. Oh, I mean, it. No. they moved all of the Democrats that used to be in that Costello and your district and moved them into the 13th. So, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, but, yeah, but I, I will say that Southwestern Illinois has changed dramatically. In, in Granite City and in Alton, you're electing Republicans. And we have a big race locally for the chairman of the county board. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have a lot of Democrats, I think, are trying to weigh in in the Republican primary to, to get a governing conservative versus what they say is a chaos conservative. So I, I, Sherry's right. I mean, it has just changed. It is, Southern Illinois is not the Costello, Glenn Pichard, Kenny Gray, Ariels. No, it'll, totally take, right. it'll take decades for that, you know, to, to change. Well, well, even in downstate Illinois, Patrick, um, in the 10 years, well, when I was in office, I served from 2012, mm -hmm. um, and then I just left office a year ago. Um, and in the, it, it was a district in the whole country that flipped from Obama to Trump by 17 points, the district that I represented. So Peoria, the Quad Cities, Rockford, and then all the, you know, the many counties in between, 14 counties all together. But it was a 17 point swing in a four year period yeah. from 2012 to 2016. So if you look at downstate Illinois, um, and, you know, we understand downstate Illinois, but I'm sitting in Chicago right now, and I'm just telling you, it's a whole different political <laughs> world when you get, out, get outside of Cook County and the Collar counties. Um, and a lot of the Democrats up in Chicago, they don't understand the rest of the state like like John and I understand it. And it, it is it is a whole different world now. I'm, I'm a kid from Iroquois County sitting in the suburbs, so I understand what you're yeah, saying. It, yeah. it's, a, it, it's, it's a completely different situation up here. And we'll scroll through some results at the top of the page as we as we chat. Uh, Congressman, I wanted to ask about your old district, uh, the 17th. Uh, you know, Eric Sorensen, I I thought was kind of a uh, a surprise winner uh, in 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 the race two years ago uh, against Esther Joy King. Um, he uh, he he obviously had some some name ideas, a former TV guy uh, and and uh, has has been relatively um active, I would say, maybe more in the electronic media world than maybe boots on the ground. Uh, Republicans seem to like their candidate, Joe McGraw, who's a, a retired, recently retired judge in in Winnebago County. Um, what what's your your take on that race as it shapes up towards the fall? Well, so first of all, um, I was not surprised that Eric won the seat um, in redistricting. We were just talking about that and, and how the districts are very different than they were in the previous 10 years. But in redistricting, the 17th congressional district that I represented for five terms, um, it got 10 points better for a Democrat. Um, and so, you know, I, I had a fight every two years because it was truly a swing district. Um, and in my first race, I never polled better than two points up. I mean, when I was getting close to the election day, um, you know, I, I knew we did everything we could, but I was either one point up, one point down, two points up, two points down. Um, and, and, but every, every two years I had a fight on my hands in redistricting, it got again, 10 points better. So I, I figured that Eric, um, could, could pull it off. It was an open seat. Um, and, um, even though, uh, King had run against me two years earlier, you know, she was not an incumbent and, um, and, and frankly did not fit that district. You know, she came in to the district within a few months of her moving there. She decided to run against me. Um, you know, so she was like a Chicago person and then an out of state or so there was plenty to, to campaign against her. But, um, going into this election cycle, Eric now has the power of incumbency. He's done a good job. He goes home, he works hard. Um, he's had some policy wins in bringing home community project funding for the district. So um, I, I feel good going into it. He's a very good fundraiser. He's got good name ID, to your point. He, he, he was on the air in two of the three media markets for 20 years. Um, you know, so that that's a lot of name ID uh, going into this this race. And then on top of it, now he's the incumbent. Uh, Congressman, I wanted to ask you about uh, the leader of your your party, Donald Trump. Uh, he, he's obviously going to he won the Illinois primary tonight. He's 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 going to have the nomination. Uh, he he very well could win in November. 
if you, if you look at the polling, it's essentially going to be, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania and 40, 47 other states. Uh, but, but in Illinois, Trump is a drag on the ticket, especially north of I-80. Maybe not so much in southern Illinois, in your neck of the woods. Uh, maybe maybe more in parts of Madison County, but definitely not out in, in, the, in the sticks. How do Republicans, in your mind, balance the huge trouble that Donald Trump puts them in in the suburbs and in the city with his immense popularity downstate? On oh sorry I muted you. Oh, I'm, I'm sure Sherry is interested in hearing my comments on, on the former president. Um, and I've always been careful in in how I, you know, address this issue. Let it all loose. We're we're recording. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm still you know just between smart, us and a few hundred friends. I'm still smart enough to know to to be careful with my word choices. Um, I will I but I I will you know I will say this is that there are. There are people in the NRCC and, and the political establishment in D.C. that thinks that Trump will help us maintain the majority in, in those districts. And they're doing the calculation. Sherry knows this because of, of her, her involvement with the, the DCCC. And so as far as the House Republicans, who I'm close to, obviously, you know, that's the horse that's been given them, that's the horse they're going to ride. And uh, I, I, I totally understand. I mean, we, we were talking about redistricting and gerrymandering and stuff. People forget that the, the district that I won was Dick Durbin's house seat, right? People forget that. So um, he, when the senator, when current senator ran for the Senate, the seat that he gave up is the seat that I won. So I, I, I've always been about we obviously gerrymandering is bad. These now our races are decided in primaries. It, it partitions us to the far left and the far right. And it doesn't, you know, get to the general election where you're going to have a debate on on, you know, the liberal and the conservative public policy. So uh, I'm obviously I'm talking a lot to not answer your question, which is a, a, a <laughs> I noticed. I noticed still a politician. That's right. I was gonna say, what are you gonna run again, John? Do you like really yeah. care what you say now? <laughs> I'm running for the border. I'm, you know, <laughs> I think, Congresswoman, I think I think the the question is fair for your side too. On the flip side, you know, Democrats are a non-factor in a lot of downstate areas. Um, you know, obviously they benefited from some gerrymandering in the House and 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 Senate and and congressional seats, but but if you get into the sticks, I mean you're talking 70, 80% in a lot of these counties for Republicans. Um, you did better than that in a lot of those Republican counties. How do Democrats play in rural areas? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you, I, th I think you can't give up on a rural area. Um, so I, I, look, from, from personal experience, serving 14 counties, 7,000 square miles, 85% um, of the towns in the district that I represented had 5,000 people or fewer. And 60% and of the towns had 1,000 people or fewer. So it was a very rural district. And um, our, our view was we were going to show up. We had a grid um, that would track all 14 of our counties and making sure that every single quarter, we, ought, we, we would always look back on the quarter, did I hit all the counties? Um, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't leaving a county out. Um, two of my five elections in the congressional district I represented, I won all 14 counties. And, um, you know, I would argue there's probably a lot of reasons for that, but, but we did not ignore the small towns in our congressional district. I served on the Ag Committee for all 10 years, the Agriculture Committee for all 10 years that I was in Congress because you had the rural development part of that where, you had a better chance of making sure that you brought money home for your for the smaller towns if you were you know had a seat at that table. So that was always really important to me. But no, I, I mean I think you show up, you listen to people, you you try to listen more than you talk. Um, you know I I think I've I've talked to the the Biden team many times over the last several months about 
making sure that there's a heck of a lot more listening than talking and figuring out how is that rural platform going to look for the second Biden administration for the second term and making sure that the word rural is mentioned going into the November election. Um, if you remember, there were criticisms of Hillary Clinton when she was running in 2016 that she never talked about rural America and didn't show up into those um, smaller towns. And, and I certainly want to make sure that the Biden team, whether it's his cabinet secretaries or President Biden personally, that the, the team is showing up and, and listening and figuring out what does that next term look like as far as making sure that it's doing right by rural America. We got to let you go because I know Sherry's got to go be on TV, a big superstar. But, John, I want to give you the last word. Um, what are you watching in this this Biden or in this uh, Bost Bailey race uh, as as we see numbers uh, continue to to trickle in tonight? Well, first of all, Bustos for Secretary of Ag. Let me just put that on the table. <laughs> we'll and hate then, that uh, idea. And then uh, you know, I think Mike has to do well. He you know he he spent a lot of money. He's overwhelmed Bailey with money. Uh, there he's uh, obviously competitive in the Paducah market. There's so many market medias, you know, Sherry knows the media too. And uh, Mike has to do well in the Southwestern part of the state, you know, that's the St. Clair counties and Monroe counties and stuff like that to offset, you know, Bailey's going to run up big numbers in his uh, old Senate district. Uh, and that's a given. That's kind of goes back to the, the old Pichard race and stuff when Glenn overwhelmed uh, in, a, in a primary race based upon the numbers. But uh, that's what we'll be watching. All right. Uh, former Congresswoman Sherry Bustos, thank you so much for the time. I, I appreciate it. Congressman John Shimkus, uh, Congresswoman Bustos, of course, now with Mercury Public Affairs. Uh, Congressman Shimkus, you're still teaching, right, at SAUE? No, I, I'm doing a little you stuff like uh, Kit Bond strategies. But That's uh, right. Yeah. All right, great. Congressman, Congresswoman, thanks so much for the time. We really appreciate your thoughts and, and input tonight, and have a great night. All right. See you, Patrick. All right. Great. Two folks that uh, I really appreciate their perspectives and their uh, their thoughts uh, as we uh, hit the eight o'clock hour here in the Illinois. Welcome again to our election night show. We are so thankful to have you. Uh, the Associated Press has called uh, the sixth congressional primary for Democrat Sean Kasten. Uh, he has uh, defeated his two challengers, uh, Manur Ahmad as well as uh, Charles Hughes. And the AP has also called, I believe, let me find it, uh, it's not showing up, but I believe that the AP uh, is has called or is about to call uh, the fourth congressional race for uh, Congressman Chewy Garcia as well. Uh, I don't see it up there, but uh, we'll let you know when, when we see it. So, uh, here it is. Uh, Congressman Chuy Garcia wins the Democratic nomination for U.S. House in the 4th Congressional District. AP race call at 752. So uh, that's uh, so Kasten and Garcia win. Uh, Bost and Bailey, uh, we are starting to see a few precincts trickle in. Uh, Bost continues to lead. Uh, again, it's early. It's really early. Uh, so, so we'll see uh, how... Uh, how these these numbers continue to to trickle in as as the night goes on. Uh, again, Garcia winning big in the fourth congressional district uh, with uh, uh, I think it's probably more than zero. We may have a a, a, a function issue there, but uh, Garcia leads Ray Lopez seventy uh, percent to uh, roughly thirty percent. The sixth congressional district called for Caston. He leads big over Manur Ahmad and Charles Hughes. In the 7th Congressional District, this one, 12% uh, of precincts reporting. Congressman Danny Davis still over 50%. Uh, still, again, a long way to go in this race, but Davis with about 24,000 votes. Melissa Conyers Urban, about 10,000 votes. 8,000 votes from Collins. And in the 11th Congressional District, Bill Foster leads the still early uh, 2,700 to about 700 over Kassam, uh, Kassim Rashid. And uh, in the 11th Congressional District Republican primary, Jerry Evans, a music school uh, owner, leads over Susan Hathaway Altman. Uh, again, this very early as well. No numbers in yet from the 17th Congressional District. Moving to the state Senate, nothing in on the 19th Senate District yet or the 20th Senate District yet. Uh, we will... Uh, 
uh, check up on that 20th Senate district here uh, shortly. I have to assume that if we're seeing congressional numbers, we're going to see that Senate primary. So if, uh, if Ben's listening, maybe he can pull up the race for us real quick. Uh, the 37th Senate district, uh, nobody, uh, no reports there yet. The 40th, nothing in yet there. And the 53rd, uh, nothing in the, the interlands of central Illinois. Now one yet. And just some early and absentee ballots in, in the 58th Senate district uh, for Terry Bryant leading over the rest of the cash. In the State House, slide all the way up to the top of our page here. Uh, Lillian Jimenez leads Kirk Ortiz with about 57% of precincts reporting. Uh, Jimenez has about 2,800 votes to about 700 for Ortiz. Uh, about 30% of uh, precincts reporting in the fifth house primary. That is Kimberly Dubuclé, uh, who previously served in the house and was then appointed uh, again uh, to, to rejoin the house. She leads Andre Smith, who's kind of a community activist, finds himself on Fox News a lot, which doesn't fit that district very well. Uh, she's leading big early on. Sonia Harper leading her primary in the sixth house district. Abdul Nasser Rashid leading his primary. Uh, with 86% of precincts reporting. That's uh, a lot early, so we'll keep an eye on that one, too. Uh, Angie Guerrero Cuellar has about 3,700 votes uh, with 30% in. Uh, she's going to be just fine. Uh, the 23rd House District, uh, this is 50% reporting. That's probably not quite right yet because that's only showing about 1,800 votes, uh, so we'll, we'll get that updated correctly. The uh, Teresa Ma race, she's... Uh, Doubling up, a little more than doubling up, Lai Ching Eng uh, in, in that uh, kind of south side, near south side, Bronzeville sort of race. Uh, 27th House District, uh, Justin Slaughter leads Teacher Juan Robinson. In the 29th House District, uh, Thaddeus Jones, who's also the mayor of Calumet City, leads big over Kermit White. In the uh, 31st House District, with 60% of precincts in, uh, Mary Flowers in big trouble. Uh, she uh, was had a, a huge organized effort against her, uh, led by House Speaker Chris Welch, uh, currently Michael Crawford, who, who benefited from some uh, $2 million in, in money from, from Welch, House Democrats and outside groups that were organized by Welch, uh, look like they're about to end Mary Flowers' long and storied legislative career uh, tonight. In the 35th House District, Democrat Mary Gill, who was uh, appointed to replace uh, in Hurley last year. She's leading big over David Dewar in the 36th House District. This one's going to be interesting, I think, as it gets late. Uh, Rick Ryan, who's the choice of outgoing rep Kelly Burke, uh, he leads Sonia Khalil, uh, about 56%, 44%. The difference of about 1,000 votes uh, and still quite a few to come in. And I don't have up in front of me where all of those remaining votes are. If you're in the city, of course, that uh, expected to be better for Lil. Uh, and then as we slide through downstate, don't have a lot to report yet uh, in those races. Uh, and in Cook County, it, it looks, holy cow, uh, a beat down for Joy Cunningham uh, in the uh, Supreme Court race. Uh, she leads Jesse Reyes 150,000 to 53,000. Uh, with about half of the precincts in, that's almost 74% for Cunningham. I, I had somebody tell me jokingly the other day that she's the perfect candidate because African-American voters know she's African-American and uh, white voters think she's Irish Catholic. So uh, with a name like Joy Cunningham. So it uh, uh, looks like it's going to be a huge win for Joy Cunningham, who was appointed to replace Ann Burke uh, as a member of the Illinois Supreme Court last year. In the Cook County State's Attorney's race, uh, the uh, the Democrats' preferred candidate, Tony Preckwinkle's candidate, is Clayton Harris III, with about half of the precincts in. He trails Eileen O'Neill Burke, about 114,000 for Burke to 97,000 for uh, Harris. Uh, conventional wisdom will tell you that it's probably the the South Side wards that are in South Suburban wards that are uh, or precincts that are coming in late. Uh, and that will likely benefit Harris, uh, though we'll keep an eye on that. And uh, Mariana Sparopoulos uh, is leading Iris Martinez handily in the race for Cook County Clerk. So uh, a lot of developments as uh, we 
we see the uh, the race for Congress in this, this 12th congressional district still very early uh, as we wait for, for numbers to come in in the uh, in the southern Illinois area. It's uh, it's going to be um, I think we're going to be up with this one for a while. Uh, and, and, and as we see, you know, these, this, it's already, you know, relatively, you know, no one's up 5,000 to 1,000 in, in early votes. So we've got a pretty clear indication here that, that these two gentlemen are going to be within the, w within each other for a little while. So, so we're probably going to have uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, of a of a fight on our hands as as we expect uh, in that race as the night goes on. So you mentioned the Associated Press is called the fourth congressional district for uh, Congressman Chewy Garcia. Uh, he leads handily over uh, Ray Lopez, and the AP is also called the sixth congressional district for Sean Caston, who leads big over uh, Manur Ahmad and Charles Hughes. And Danny Davis continues to lead in the seventh congressional district. Uh, he has about 24,000 votes uh, and about 10,000 for Melissa Conyers Irvin, about 8,000 for Kena Collins with uh, close to 70% reporting. Still very early in the 11th congressional district, uh, Bill Foster leads Qasem Rashid. Uh, and in the uh, Republican side on the 11th district, Jerry Evans uh, narrowly leads uh, Susan Hathaway Altman as we uh, as we continue to see those numbers just sort of uh, start to trickle in. So uh, a couple of a couple of things to note, of course, still early. You know, it's it's only 8 11. Uh, so so we have a long way to go uh, in in the um, uh, and just got another update on the Cunningham Reyes race. So, yeah, it's even bigger now. She's got 88 percent. Holy cow. Uh, I, I I don't think anybody expected that to be a close race, but she's at eighty eight percent. And and this state's attorney's race, um, I I I I've got to think Harris is going to win. Um, even you know with you would think that uh, Burke was probably going to to bank her votes downtown and in kind of those near suburbs that uh, that. Uh, vote early, or that get their numbers in a little bit sooner. The the thing you know, and I live I live just outside of of city limits in in the suburbs, and the presence or lack thereof by the Burke campaign has been appalling. Um, I, I the only sign you see I've seen at all for Eileen Burke in in my neck of the woods in in suburban Cook County is is outside of a uh, uh, an early voting site, you know, and it's not like Harris has, has had much of a presence either, but, but, you know, demographics and vote share and Kim Fox's popularity would, would tell you that, that this is where Burke would want to, would want to bank her votes. And, and yet I don't, I don't necessarily know what, what they were doing. So, it's it's uh it's going to be really um it, it's going to be really really interesting to see uh, how uh, how that one shakes out over the next uh so I'm getting I'm we're we're waiting for some of our numbers to get updated but I'm also seeing that uh, there are a few more precincts coming in in the 12th district uh, and Boss leading Bailey there so uh, so we'll see how. Uh, how that one continues to to come in as uh, those those numbers uh, track in, um, and our friend Dan Brady, who was scheduled to join us in this uh, block, is having some issues logging in. Let me uh, try and forward that to him again. Apologies. Welcome to a live stream uh, as we try to deal with uh, technical issues as they uh, are in front of us. Um, and there we go. So hopefully uh, Representative Dan Brady will join us shortly. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's bring in uh, the other half of uh, the the panel that we were uh, expecting uh, this uh, this part of our eight o'clock hour. Uh, we welcome Denise Wang Stoneback 
a uh, former state representative from uh, Skokie in suburban Cook County. Uh, she uh, is served one term in the House, now uh, involved in a nonprofit called Truth in Politics, which we'll give you a chance to talk about. Uh, representative, thanks for taking a few minutes for us tonight. Uh, I, I guess you know we spent a lot of the first hour talking about that Southern Illinois Boss Bailey race, uh, Cook County, the northern part of the state. Uh, also, a real uh, a real um, a real center of attention tonight. What what are you specifically watching uh, in Cook County and and in the the city of Chicago tonight? Well, I'm very interested in in following all the races across Illinois through, as I mentioned to you, uh, the lens of ethical campaigns through my work uh, in in Citizens for Ethical Campaigns, a new nonprofit that I I just started. And uh, obviously, definitely in, in uh, the northern part of Illinois, uh, we're looking at all different races, congressional races, state representative races, ju judicial races, the Cook County State's Attorney. But as I said, we're, we're really focusing, I've been focusing on uh, seeing which races are, uh, are, are, have candidates that have signed on to the Code of Fair Campaign Practices. Um, so a lot of folks across Illinois are not aware that in 1989, the Illinois legislature actually passed a Fair Campaign Practices Act to encourage healthy competition uh, in political races. And it's a voluntary code that all candidates are encouraged to subscribe to and sign on and say that they will be honest and civil and use ethical behavior in their campaigns. And so the nonprofit uh, that I am now leading, uh, we have encouraged over 400 candidates uh, running in different races across Illinois that have registered with the Illinois State Board of Elections. And uh, we have, uh, we're really happy to say that there are at least 89 candidates across Illinois who have signed on and subscribed to the code. Um, so I'm particularly looking at some of the races where both candidates have signed on or one candidate has signed on and one has not and seeing those results and then hopefully surveying the districts uh, in some of these very hotly contested races to see if, uh, if, if there has been uh, unethical behavior and how they're feeling about the races afterwards. Let's, let's talk about the Cook County state's attorney's race. Cause you know, I'm, I'm, we're, we're both kind of in that, that area ringing around the city of Chicago where, where, where folks are incredibly concerned about, uh, crime, uh, and, and the, you know, the failure of, of Kim Fox in, in her administration. Um, she, she did very poorly in, uh, in, in suburban cook four years ago. Um, there's been a lot of mudslinging in this race. You know, mm -hmm. Burke has been attacked over a, a conviction she got as a prosecutor 30 years ago. And, and Harris has been uh, attacked as, as, as someone who's going to let every criminal out, uh, you know, whether it's from a political lens or an ethical lens, uh, what do you think of what you've seen in this race so far? Well, um, as it's it's really it's disappointing to see the mudslinging. It really is uh, because I think voters really deserve uh, to focus to be able to focus on the issues. And uh, crime is certainly an issue and a concern. Uh, I think that people are frustrated by the level of crime that there is in Chicago and the immediate outlying areas of Cook County. And it's, um, so it'll be interesting to see. I was very interested in those early numbers that you showed. Um, it, it, we would have loved to see more uh, on policy positions, I think, and less mudslinging. Because I think, I definitely think that the mudslinging gets in the way of really allowing the voters to focus on the issues and to focus on who they would prefer and who they feel is more qualified. Um, so, yeah, we'll we'll have to see. I think we'll be up. Uh, maybe we'll be up watching those results. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's there. It's showing eighty seven percent of precincts in. I mean, obviously, yeah. uh, Cook has has the you know kind of tele uh, transmission that they can do with uh, from precinct sites that a lot of downstate communities don't have and and burke showing a uh i can pull my screen up real quick let me uh 
uh, as uh, Burke leads 205,000 to 186,000. This is 87% of precincts reporting. So uh, we don't yet know exactly where the remaining precincts come from, uh, but the uh, the the uh, issues are. Uh, it looks like that one may may be close as as the night goes on. I, I also um, I was a little surprised at the huge uh, lead so far for for Joy Cunningham, the the uh, Supreme Court justice who was uh, appointed to replace Ann Burke, who uh, you know was and I don't know maybe maybe Reyes didn't make enough of an issue of of Burke with you know who was on her husband's shoulder every day when he. Uh, right. Went into federal court last fall, which Lord knows that's an ethics issue. Uh, I mean, but after she was off the court, of course. But um, what's what's your take here that 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 Cunningham is is absolutely cruising in this one? Yeah, it's it's surprising to see such a wide margin in this race, I think, uh, because Jesse Reyes has been around. He's a well known, well liked figure. Um, in politics, and uh, I, I, I am quite surprised to see that huge uh, lead at this point. Uh, we'll just, you know, have to see. And then, you, you know, if you if you look at uh, perhaps where the financial backing is coming, where the the incumbency, all of these factors together, these all are really uh, factors that are putting uh, that are coming into play, I guess. Um, so, yeah. What's what's going on in the legislature? You know, you 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 know, of course, lost a primary, which happens in politics. But the 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 House Democrats are clearly moving leftward. Uh, there there continues to be in Springfield some, uh, you know, and, and this may be more of a Senate issue than a House issue because you had so many Senate Democrats who were who were indicted and a couple are even serving under indictment. Uh, one is currently serving under indictment. Um, are Democrats in Springfield not paying attention enough to to ethics uh, under their own nose? Well, I certainly would like to see Democrats in Springfield focus more on ethics. Uh, I introduced multiple bills around elections and ethics. I introduced the Truth in Politics Act towards the end of my term. I think it is uh, very much needed in Illinois. And uh, it would it would make the Illinois Code of Fair Campaign Practices mandatory in, in Illinois. Um, it, that is the way it is in Arkansas, believe it or not. Um, if you don't subscribe to the code, your name does not appear on the ballot. And it would also prohibit false statements in electoral campaigns in some manner, which is something that 27 other states do, uh, but not Illinois. And so I think that, uh, um, I would love to see a bipartisan group of people in the legislature come together to work, uh, really concentrate on the issue of ethics and ethics in campaigning. I think it's uh, past time. What's the, you know, and, and if you if you want to take this from an ethics perspective, I mean, you know, there there, there's there's going to be a tax. There are always going to be attacks. There are always going to be fights. There's always going to be mudslinging in politics. So, so how do you make that line? I mean, you put in a bill essentially that would 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 criminalize telling lies about your your opponent, which is uh, I, I I thought was interesting because that's that kind of happens all the time in campaigns. I mean, how how realistic is it to to change the system like like this? I think we need to change the culture before we change the system. And I think that shift is is happening. Uh, we just encouraged uh, candidates to sign on to the Code of Fair Campaign Practices and more candidates signed on. I think as, the, as candidates realize that voters are frustrated, they're tired of the mudslinging, they're tired of not knowing what to believe it, when you know election time comes around. They don't know where people really stand or 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 what's true and what's not true. So I think that we've got a lot of frustrated voters. And one thing you said earlier this evening, um, which really caught my attention, is that uh, this is very low turnout. Um, I think that as voters are frustrated with the level of unethical behavior, lies and mudslinging, um, they're they're not coming to the polls because they don't they sit they sit it out they don't know what to believe uh, they don't know what's true 
and we have really a decrease in civic engagement and uh, and people who are willing to put themselves forward and run for office because uh, of course anyone who's run for office knows what a commitment and personal sacrifice it is to put yourself out there like that and uh, and I think a lot of really good people who would be excellent public servants um, just are they're not running for office because they don't want to get involved in something like this. So if we could raise the bar of ethical behavior in Illinois, I think that we could really improve our democracy um, and uh, and encourage better voter turnout, better civic engagement, better trust between citizens and public officials. And um, apologies to Representative Brady. It looks like we had some technical issues on his end, so hopefully we'll uh, we'll, we'll be able to chat with him soon down the line. But before we get, let you go, Representative, um, I, I, I want to ask about Joe Biden and and his issues with with Democrats. Um, he he is obviously you know going to win. He won Illinois. He's going to uh, he's he's going to win the Democratic nomination. He he has some weakness on the left though. Uh, and, and he also has some weakness in the middle with his, uh, his, his, his age, uh, you know, and, and some of the, the other policy positions he's been in from a suburban perspective, obviously voters are probably choosing Biden over Trump, but what kind of struggles and why does he have them uh, among, among suburban voters? Well, I think that age, his age is an issue with some Democrats and they're somewhat skeptical. There are some Democrats that are skeptical of whether uh, he is too old for this position. Um, I feel that he is clearly the best candidate uh, and he is very capable and has a great team behind him. Um, so, but I, I do think that uh, the Biden team certainly is aware of this issue and, and, and responding to it. Um, it's, uh, no one wanted to see, uh, necessarily, a, a Biden Trump rematch. And that's what we've got. Unfortunately, um, it's, uh, it, it'll just, we'll have to see in November what happens, but, um, I cer certainly think Illinois, definitely, uh, we have the DNC coming up <laughs> in Illinois. So, um, we're definitely, uh, Going and to it'll be, be a spectacle, that's for sure. It'll be, it'll be a huge, huge spectacle and very exciting. All right. Former State Representative Denise Wang Stoneback, thanks so much for the time. We appreciate it. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Patrick. All right. Thanks to Denise Wang Stoneback for her time. Uh, apologies to Dan Brady. Apparently his uh, uh, connection was a little unstable, so uh, we... Uh, weren't able to uh, hook up with him when there he is. So, uh, Dan, maybe we can uh, hook you up at 840. Would that would you be willing to do that? Because uh, we've got another uh, guest about to join us. So let me I will uh, text you shortly. But uh, just to quickly go over our uh, updated uh, numbers uh, in the uh, 12th congressional district. Let me pull that up really quickly. Uh, we're starting to see some precincts trickle in. Uh, Mike Boss leads Darren Bailey, 30, uh, actually 6329 uh, to 3691, with 6% of precincts reporting. Uh, the AP's already called the fourth congressional race for. Uh, Jesus Chewy Garcia over Ray Lopez. The sixth has been called for Sean Caston. Uh, the seventh, Danny Davis, continues uh, to, to stay over 50% uh, over Melissa Conyers Irvin and Keena Collins. Uh, Bill Foster leading handily as uh, precincts starting to come in. In the 11th, uh, Jerry Evans, the Republican, likely Republican winner, uh, as we start to see some numbers come in there. And uh, nothing yet in the 17th. In the state Senate, uh, Samantha Gasca uh, leads uh, early in the 19th Senate Republican primary. Graciela Guzman leading in the uh, 20th Senate district. Uh, this is a little closer than I thought it would be, but it's showing 78% of precincts in. in. The 37th Senate district, uh, Lee Ariano uh, leads Tim Yeager with 22% of precincts in. Uh, incumbent Patrick Joyce going to be fine. Uh, nothing yet in the 53rd and still just a couple of early and absentee ballots in the uh, 58th. Uh, Lillian Jimenez leads, Kim Dubuclay leads, Sonia Harper leads, Abdel Nasser Rashid uh, leads uh, pretty handily over Vidal Vasquez, Andrew Guerrero Cuellar leading big, Edgar Gonzalez leads, Teresa Ma leads, 
Justin Slaughter, uh, Thaddeus Jones going to win. Uh, Mary Flowers continues to trail relatively big in her race with 60% of precincts reporting. Mary Gill, uh, the appointed incumbent in the 31st first. Uh, 35th leads big, uh, remains close in the 36th uh, as uh, we wait for more numbers to come in there. Hannah Billingsley likely to win in the 49th uh, House District uh, Republican uh, primary as they look for a candidate to take on Maura Hershauer. In the 76th, uh, Cohen Barnes leads early uh, over Amy Murray Briel and Carolyn Zasada. And, uh, and let's see if we have anything else, nothing else early on in, uh, those races. And then of course, in Cook County, we've been showing you Joy Cunningham for Supreme court up huge, uh, close race between Eileen O'Neill Burke and Clayton Harris, the third and Mariana Spiropoulos leads Iris Martinez, the incumbent circuit clerk, uh, by a big margin, uh, as, as well with 37% of those precincts reporting. So, uh, it is 8.30 here in the Illinois, and we are excited and honored uh, to bring in the 38th governor of the state of Illinois, Jim Edgar, uh, for a conversation uh, this uh, this evening. Uh, governor, good evening. Thanks for the time. How are you doing? Fine, Patrick. Good to be with you. Well, I, I, I want to get... I gotta tell you, I gotta, this is a special night. This is a lot better night than 50 years ago. 50 years ago tonight, I ran my first time for public office and I lost in the Republican primary. And at 27, I thought my career was over. So anybody out there, young people, just, you know, you're going to have some stumbles along the way. So, but I was thinking all day today, today's going to end a lot better than it did 50 years ago. Well, uh, you don't have to deal with, with politics other than Gavin with me. So it could be, yeah. it could be a lot worse, right? Yeah. Right. Um, and I'm not going to lose. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so Governor, I, I, you know, you and I have have talked uh, previously about the, uh, the the direction of the Republican Party, and and you know, you and I essentially kind of don't don't fit there, you know, as as someone who you were obviously the the leader of the state party. I'm someone that worked, you know, in Republican politics for many years. What kind of identity crisis are Republicans having now in? Uh, in, in 2024, as as Donald Trump continues to uh, to be the the standard bearer of the GOP. Well, I mean, Donald Trump has taken over the Republican Party. It's not the party that I was part of as governor. Uh, it's not the party of Ronald Reagan. Not the party of Dwight Eisenhower. I mean, the, just the attitude toward the Soviet Union. I mean, Russia uh, and Ukraine. I mean, that, it's just completely changed. And uh, you know, it is what it is. I I don't see nationally uh, it's going to bounce back to be more a little more to the center where I think it then could win more elections. Uh, but uh, as I said, it is what it is. Now, in Illinois, I don't think it's as bad off as it is in other states and it is nationally. We still have a somewhat moderate, not a term really apical. We have a conservative group versus a far right group that I think is reasonable. And I think the leadership in the Republicans in the legislature uh, reflects that. There's some battles tonight in primaries that, you know, could have an impact on that. So while the party, I think, has moved too far to the right, but more importantly, that it's been taken in by this pseudo he, Trump never was a Republican. I still don't think he is. Uh, but as I said, there, I think there's there's more hope in Illinois than there is nationwide. But even saying that, uh, we're still, I think, a long way in Illinois from being competitive in a race for U.S. Senate, but particularly for governor. And that's one that really matters. That really shapes the state. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the debacle we went through a couple of years ago uh, with Bailey, uh, that set us back and it's, it's going to take some time. Uh, and that leads, I mean, I think that leads to, to how Republicans managed to stay relevant in Illinois in the meantime. I mean, you've got uh, the party had a terrible time recruiting candidates for congressional races, for legislative races, especially North of I-80 uh, because 
they know the leader of their party is going to lose Illinois by a million votes. It's going to drag them down in the suburbs. But but clearly he's so popular in the southern half of the state. You know, I mean, he got my home county and Iroquois County. He got 80 percent of the vote four years ago. He's going to do it again. So so how do Republicans balance somebody who's so popular with with their core, but is so toxic with with the the swing voters that they need to win in November? Well, we've seen an exit from the Republican Party of a lot of the moderates. Uh, they're either now independents or they become Democrats. I mean, a lot of people that I've known that helped me, uh, they wouldn't anymore take a Republican ballot. I mean, you know, I took one. I, you know, I said it gives me a chance to vote against Trump twice. But uh, that's part of the dilemma. We've lost a lot of people that used to make up the Republican Party. They have moved uh, to independent status or they've moved to the Democrats. Uh, and so come primary day, we don't have as many of the more moderate Republicans showing up. It's more that come from the far right. And primaries determine elections in, in this day and age with the way districts are gerrymandered, both Republican and Democrat. So that that's a problem. We've got to get more people involved in voting in primaries. Uh, again, I, I you know, if Trump is not successful, and I wouldn't rule out him winning, I mean, I'm, I got to say, I, Put aside any partisan feelings. I'm just scared to death of this nation uh, if he gets another four years. Particularly, there's no restraint on him. Uh, he, you know, he's he's going to be far worse, in my estimation, than he was four years ago. Uh, but if he doesn't win, uh, we can begin to kind of maybe rebuild the party. Now it's going to be never going to come back to where it was when I was governor, uh, even in Illinois. Uh, it's it's going to be much more right of center. But it, it, I think, hopefully, would be a party and have leaders that you would not be embarrassed by what they're saying. They wouldn't go out and stir up trouble. Uh, they, you know, you could disagree philosophically, but people that you could respect. And to me, that, <clears throat> that's one of the major channel challenges in government today, both Republicans and Democrats, is winning the trust of the public toward public officials. And that's why I think we have to have people who are uh, choose their words carefully, don't say outlandish things just to stir up the base uh, because it has serious repercussions as we saw on January 6th. Uh, and again, I, I, I hope, but uh, I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime that we come back and uh, win statewide races like we used to in Illinois. What's abortion going to mean for Republicans in November? Well, I, I, you know, one of the big problems we have as the party is the suburbs used to be where we would, you know, I'd get 70 percent in those townships uh, and those uh, counties up there. Uh, we don't do that. We're lucky to break even. Uh, and abortion is a big part of that. Uh, Trump and abortion, and of course, you, they're, they're tied together because Trump put the Supreme Court on that overturned Roe versus Wade. Uh, but I, that is something that's really an impediment for even moderate Republicans because they get brushed or painted with the same brush uh, that those that are to the far right. And, you know, I classic example was the defeat for the county board chairman in DuPage County uh, two years ago. That was really the future of the party. And uh, here you had a candidate who was pro-choice, but he got locked mm -hmm. in as a Republican with all the anti-pro-choice uh, and uh, lost very close, but still lost. So that's that's a an issue that's going to hurt Republicans this year. It might be Joe Biden's only way he's going to win is the, that might have enough enthusiasm. That's what when I look at Biden. His problem is enthusiasm, uh, getting his vote out. Turnout's going to be the key. Uh, it is in any election, but this election will... The Democrats will Biden get those people he had four years ago to come out. Trump voters are going to come out no matter what. I mean, there's no way uh, you could have a, a blizzard. Trump could be convicted of 10 crimes. Those people are going to come out and vote for him. The question is, will that Democratic vote come out, particularly to the left? Are they going to want 100 uh, percent perfection of what they think a president ought to do? Joe Biden is only 95 percent. Uh, 
they may not vote. And that that could affect this election. But I think abortion will hurt Republicans. It might save uh, Joe Biden. Before we let you go, give me one thing positive about what you see in, in in Republican politics or politics in general. We can we can sit here and complain about Trump all day, but I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, as as you look no, at no, Illinois no. politics or in general, what 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 well, what's, what good do you see? Uh, one thing I do see good. I mean, I don't say this about the Trump people. They are enthusiastic. They are there. I think they're somewhat misguided, and I think they're following a false prophet. Uh, but they, they do, and a lot of those people had never really voted before. So, you know, that's more people involved in the process. Uh, I think the abortion issue showed that you can get people motivated that aren't the Trump people. Uh, and hopefully there'll be enough Republicans who maybe agree with a lot of things about Trump, but they would like to win an election. Uh, doesn't do any good. Uh, to have candidates that you believe in, but they never win elections. I mean, the idea of an election is to win. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get back to that. But I do, as I said, in Illinois, I think there's still, I think the, the legislature, my big concern is the Democrats have so many votes, they get sloppy and they do foolish things and they ignore Republicans don't get an opportunity to be part of it. I mean, I'd, I'd much rather see the legislature little closer divided. So you had to have both parties involved in trying to come up with solutions. I think you'd have better programs. Uh, but I, I do think we have a core in the legislature and the Republican Party that uh, mean well. And are well, if they could get a few more votes that think the way they do, as opposed to some of those who vote against everything, then I think we could begin to rebuild the party here in Illinois. Jim Edgar, the 38th governor of the state of Illinois. My, uh, uh, my 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 shining city on a political hill, uh, Governor. I, I appreciate your your uh, your your input as always. I've got an Edgar bumper sticker floating around here somewhere too. I was going to show it off, but couldn't find it. So don't, uh, thanks. My, don't show it to my wife. She gets nervous. <laughs> I think I've got a Brenda sticker around here too. So was yeah. that ninety four that they made those? So uh, uh, not, go. Not both. probably ninety four because I think she won the election. I went out on her coattail. Well, she was, yeah, she was far more popular than you yeah. in 94. So, Governor, thank you so much for the time. Good we really appreciate it. And we'll talk thank to you soon. You. Yeah. All right. Thanks to Governor Edgar for, for joining us. We'll uh, have our, our next panel join us here in just a minute. Uh, always uh, honored to, to, to talk to Governor Edgar. He's, he's a, uh, uh, you know, somebody in, in politics that I've always admired not necessarily because of every issue but because in a world where people speak honestly and and do things you know that they that they mean in politics there are fewer of those uh these days and jim edgar is one of them and and i'm i'm always thankful for his input and his his comments so uh we'll we'll bring in our next guest here in just a couple of minutes we'll run down a couple of these races really quickly 43 percent of precincts in in the 12th congressional district mike boss leads darren bailey with about eighteen thousand five hundred votes to about fifteen thousand five hundred votes uh, the AP has already called the 4th District race for Chewy Garcia and the 6th District race for Sean Caston. Danny Davis continues to lead in the 7th Congressional District, still over 50%. Uh, Bill Foster uh, leading in the uh, 11th Congressional District. Jerry Evans in the Republican primary in the 11th. Uh, and still nothing in on that 17th District race uh, just yet. In the 20th Senate District, Nat uh, Graciela Guzman pulling away uh, from Natalie Toro. Uh, as expected, uh, Guzman's probably going to win that race uh, as 88% uh, of precincts are in. Uh, Guzman is uh, uh, yeah up over 9,000. So that's an almost 3,000 uh, uh, vote lead for, uh, for Guzman in that race. Uh, and not a lot changed so far in uh, those races. A couple of the state house races were looking at just for quick updates. The uh, 31st was one that we were paying close attention to. Uh, and that is uh, Mary Flowers, who was losing a um, couple of new votes there. She's still down pretty significantly to uh, Michael Crawford. So we have uh, we have two of our, our, our panelists uh, here. We're expecting another. We'll add him when, when, when he gets here, uh, if, if, uh, hoping that we don't have any uh technical issues again hey dan brady's here 
<laughs> after uh, he had some technical issues getting him in, but uh, we're glad he's here. Uh, state representative, former state representative Dan Brady, uh, who was the Republican nominee for Secretary of State in 2022, and Steve Tomaszewski, a Southern Illinois politico who uh, is the longtime spokesman, spokesman, was the longtime spokesman uh, for former Congressman John Shimkus. Uh, gentlemen, good evening. Uh, we're expecting John Bradley, the former state representative, to join us too, uh, but I uh, uh, have not seen him just yet. Uh, busy night for everybody, but uh, Dan, you've kind of been hanging out for a minute, so I'll give you uh, I'll give you first uh, uh, first swing here. Um, it looks like ba uh, Boston is leading Bailey. I don't I don't have the uh, uh, the map as to where all the votes are in from yet, but Boston is, is leading with not quite half the vote in yet. Um, what's your expectation? Uh, you know, you traveled the state. You were on a ticket that Darren Bailey was on the top of. Uh, what? How do you look at that race? Well, first off, Patrick, hopefully you can hear me this time, and, and we're coming through loud and clear. And thanks for the. Yeah, he's not great. Sounds good. Good. Yep. Um, what what I what I take from from tonight so far is the situation that I think um, uh, with with uh, the congressional race you, you spoke of, uh, Mike Boss and um, Darren Bailey, uh, you know, being cut from similar cloth, uh, but showing what. I think in a, in a particular Southern Illinois area that um, that Mike Bost, <clears throat> a former colleague of mine in the House as well, has, has done an excellent job of representing the people, uh, but yet has also been someone who works uh, not only across the aisle, but isn't a constant no on things and can see uh, the benefits, what's back and important for his district. So um, that that's my take on that race. And um, you know, when you look at some of the other races that you just talked about a little bit, shifting gears to the state house race, uh, there's a couple that we're watching and, and it'll be interesting to see how, how things end up. And again, you know, two things in, in, uh, uh, politics, somebody once told me, uh, that wins, uh, one's, uh, one's money and the other's media, um, and, you know, money in a couple of these races, I think are extremely important that, um, uh, the resources mismatch for resources. Steve, you're you're in that neck of the woods. Uh, you know, you were on the ground for many years with John Shimkus uh, in, in a lot of that district is after it got redistricted in, in 2021 for 2022. Um, are are you surprised that this race is this close? So I actually live in that district and kind of, um, following up with what uh, Representative Brady said, uh, I got at least I want to say probably eight pieces pro Bost or anti Bailey and none from Bailey. Uh, so I think that that money factor um, maybe will come into play as uh, results keep coming in and Bost can hang on to this seat. The other thing to remember is Mike Bost has always been that candidate who has been able to rally his steep Southern Illinois base um, for him and has used that uh, time and time again. And so uh, if he can hold on to this, I would imagine those um, Jackson, Williamson and further south and even up on towards uh, my side, uh, Randolph, Monroe, St. Clair numbers for Mike um, would probably uh, be what uh, helps him keep that seat versus those far eastern, which I'm sure are Bailey by, you know, 60 to 80 percent. Dan, I know you had to, uh, at least you maybe cut, tried to keep um, Bailey a little bit at arm's length as as he was uh, kind of spinning down at the end of the 22 campaign. But you certainly saw the energy of his supporters, especially in the primary. What was it about Darren Bailey that that appealed to to so many Republicans? Well, in, in the primary side of things, obviously, which is a, a totally different animal, um, the organization, as you just indicated, was there. The passion was there. Uh, the fire in the belly was there. Uh, his supporters and, and the organization uh, was something that was uh, amazing to me. Um, and and I would just say it was it was it was truly a grassroots effort that you can pull off in a primary. But in in the state, uh, when you shift the stage to the general election. Uh, and I experienced it. it. It's a whole new ball game, uh, and so that's that's what impressed me um, from the Bailey camp uh, in that primary situation. And the reality was that 
um, uh, you know, those that were getting involved and in, in, in the, the experts and the, uh, the paid consultants and all on the other side of the camps, um, uh, they underestimated and they underestimated the will of the people. Um, and that was still something could be counted on when you go out and work hard in, in a primary situation. Uh, and you, you aren't, you know, kicked in the teeth with so much money against you. Um, and you still can, in a primary, get those Republican voters who are going to be voting. You can see we've added a fourth face to the screen. That is uh, former state representative John Bradley, uh, one of the uh, now uh, endangered Southern Illinois <laughs> Democrats. Uh, he, he served in the House from, what was it, 2003 to 2014? I don't have it in front of me 16, now, John, but yeah, three to uh, 2017. But uh, and and now uh, is on uh, uh, teaches at the University of Illinois College of Law. Uh, John, we're, we're, we're heavily into this 12th district race tonight sure. just because that's been. Uh, that's that's probably the hottest race in the state yes. um, from a Democratic perspective, a, a Southern Illinoisan. Uh, what do you see in that race? Well, I think you I think you're starting to see the outlines of the way this race is going to go and, and really where the fight is at. You've got Darren Bailey, who represented uh, the area known as the Eastern Bloc, which was formerly the Keys counties. You remember when Alan Keys ran against Barack Obama? President Barack Obama in the uh, Illinois primary, and he won a few counties out of the entire state. They were up in the Darren Bailey Senate district. So we used to call these counties right in the middle. If you're looking at the map of that district, if you look right down the middle, I-57, Jefferson, Franklin, Williamson, Carbondale, Saline, the Southern Cross. And that used to be sort of a Democratic stronghold, or at least a Democratic uh, battleground. Uh, some was stronghold, some was battleground. Now you're sort of seeing that as the battleground in this Republican primary, where Mike Boss to the west of that is, is running up pretty good numbers, and Darren Bailey to the east of that is running up pretty good numbers. So the question is going to be, who wins that cross? And then what's going to be the difference in percentages of numbers between the two sides of it, the east and the west side of that district? And, you know, as of right now, Boston's ahead. He's holding his own ground better, and he's winning that, that cross area, which is Franklin, Williamson, Celine, Jefferson. Um, I'm sorry, not Celine, Jefferson and Jackson, but he's losing the east side of that, and he's losing uh, Marion County. So I think that's really where you're going to see that race decided tonight in terms of, of how that goes, who's going to get the highest percentage on either side of that, and are they going to get their numbers within that battleground area? Steve, what's the political difference in, in the two halves of that district? I mean, like, you know, you're the you're you're in the Metro East side, but you get down to southeastern Illinois and it's it's a totally different world. No, I think and and John knows this as well that that there's a some more religious uh conservative and it used to be more split Democrat Republican, but it was more religious conservative, I think, than you see over in Metro East, uh, where uh, more of it was a was a more fiscal. Trump has got a whole new dynamic to all of that these days. But uh, but I think that's from my perspective, when Congressman Shimkus first got uh, redistricted down to that uh, southern area, that uh, even the it just was a different feel. John, what happened to the Southern Illinois Democrat? Um, I think we held on longer than most of the rest of the country, truthfully. Um, if you look at the rural areas and rural Democrats, we lost hundreds of hundreds of seats in the legislatures over the years. Part of that was, I think, more attention and resources being put into those races by national Republicans. Part of it was the messaging of the national parties. And part of it was, I think, the coal mining areas held on the longest and uh, after all the other rural areas mm -hmm. fell uh, for the Democrats, I think we held on to the coal areas for the longest amount of time. And then, you know, in the 2016 race, you know, when it turned, it turned fast. So I had, I think 15 elections and I'd never had a close election and I'd had opponents and I'd had never a close election. And so, you know, and then you also have sort of the influx of huge amounts of spending in these rural districts. And so, you know, um, after Speech Now, after Citizens United, 
we saw a real change in the dynamics of these rural elections in particular. And so you saw millions of dollars and, and, and the dynamics are different in these smaller markets. I apologize. My lighting's not better. <laughs> I haven't done any of these in a while, but you see an interesting dynamic. And I think Bill Enyard said this, former Congressman General Enyard said this earlier. The Boss Bailey race is not on St. Louis television because it's so expensive. But you can get on the Marion market. Mm -hmm. You can get on the Paducah market. And and you can you can do nice big buys there in those markets. And he did. I mean, Boss did. Lead. Yeah. And yeah, they got the table too, right? Yeah, I mean, Boss essentially was untouched in yes. in in that that Harrisburg, Paducah, Cape Girardeau yeah. market from January third to about four weeks ago. Bailey gave him the field, and it yeah. was similar to what Robert was doing against us in 2015 and 16 when he went on TV like a year before the election. But right? but then Steve, but then Steve, why hasn't Boss pulled away if he was so unchecked for so long in that district? Uh, all you got to do is look two years ago to the, or four, I guess, at this point, to the um, Davis Miller race. Or that was, no, that was two years ago. Uh, two years ago. Two, two primary. To the Davis, you know, the that very conservative Republican primary voter today, it wants that Trump like voice who's going to be loud and obnoxious and um, scream and shout versus legislate. And that's that's what this is. It's, I mean, Boss well, is the chairman of the committee. Office, right? uh, that's how Congressman Boss took office. I mean, the Democrats, my party, thought that the, his- Yeah, uh, that's true. Throwing, that's true. On the throwing the papers in the Springfield. It, just, yeah, it, it didn't hurt him at all. It just catapulted him into Congress. And that's not to take anything away from Mike and his. You well, know, and that twenty four he, he should have played that in his primary to show how. It did not hurt him no. at all. And no, so, to all. your point, I agree with you, Steve. I think that sometimes we sort of try to outshout each other, and maybe I'm doing it now, right? But it's like, I think it, I think we try to outshout each other sometimes, and I think he said, "Go on." I mean, Bailey's first ad was during the Super Bowl, yeah. and he had a flamethrower. That's on brand, isn't it? Well, yeah. But um, I, I mean, first time I've ever seen a flamethrower in an ad. I've seen plenty of, of rifles in ads. Uh, John, uh, I, I'll ask you the same question I asked Dan, whose who's video dropped off here. Uh, you know, again, because you're down there, you know, Steve's down there. Um, what is it about Darren Bailey that fires so many people up? I think it's exactly what Steve said. I think, number one, you've got the name recognition because he ran for governor. And then I, I think he appeals to a far right, uh, be, you know, beyond conservative, far right conservative uh, base. And look, <laughs> there are a lot of people in this area that are further right than Mike Bost. Right. I used to be considered a conservative Democrat. I used to be considered mm -hmm. uh, far right by members of my party. And and I thought that I represented my constituency well, and I thought I represented the beliefs of my constituency. And I think what you've seen in these rural districts is that these districts have moved even further to the right. And Mike and I were aligned on a lot of issues, most issues as legislators sitting side by side, sitting next to each other on the floor and sitting across from each other geographically. And, and our votes were nearly identical on almost everything. But now you see that there is a whole nother group of voters that are to the right of us. Uh, and, and before group, before we let you go, Dan, uh, I'll, I'll give you, and you've got a, you're muted there, Dan. Um, the, uh, you you know you're not a moderate, but you're definitely on that more centrist side of the Republican Party. If if Darren Bailey wins this primary, what does it mean for for Republicans, especially as they try and cobble together some sort of statewide coalition? 
Well, I think it would be a shot in the arm for that particular branch of the party, but that particular branch of the party uh, is, in my opinion, uh, throughout the entire state, is what has become more important to that particular part of the party is that um, winning um, the primary seems to be uh, the focus and, and not the big picture of a general election. And you, you can't get to that general election. And the party doesn't seem to be able to come together after these primaries uh, because of how divisive primaries have been and gotten over the years, especially. Steve, what are you looking for as, as things uh, as we see numbers continue to, to come in over the, the rest of the night? Yeah, I don't know what I've, I've seen. I don't know how what the percentage is in, but I've got, there's a number on my phone that says 54 Boston, 46 Bailey. Again, I don't know where those are coming from, but I think if that would hold on, uh, yeah, it's a little higher vote total, 61,000 I got on my phone. Steve, so it, I don't know if that's when the, that's updated. So Yes, Steve, um, according to the information that I'm seeing online, similar number, uh, a big part of that eastern side of the district has not reported yet. That'll obviously be good for Bailey. If, if, oh, okay. if, if these right. numbers hold, uh, but as long as be very so, tight. Yeah. And, 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 Patrick, and John, what are you watching? Yeah, well, Patrick, if, if that, I think it can tighten. The thing we didn't talk about is. Yeah, Patrick. Good, Steve, I, finish your thought. Pat, Patrick, Steve, or do you, look, let me look. It's one thing that's interesting to me. Oh, oh is that, <laughs> sorry. The thing that I was going to mention were these. <laughs> Uh, state house races over in that eastern part as well. Those well, primaries well that, that are in that Bailey strong part. That yeah, yeah that that could be good for some of the other incumbents over there that are under uh, that have primaries. I think right. Speaker Welch is having a good night. Uh, I think President Biden's having a good night. I am somewhat shocked by the amount of undervotes that Donald Trump's getting. And there's a lot more Democrat votes being uh, cast in Illinois, and you would expect that in a Democratic state. But if you look at the total numbers and the undervotes that are occurring in those races, and they both have other names on the ballot, and there's almost 20 percent in a decided race that are voting against Trump. And Biden's holding over 90 percent of the votes. And that's a little bit surprising to me. And if that continues, if that trend continues, and that bodes well for Biden and the general you know, in the general in the fall, because I think, again, that's going to be something where who holds their base better. All right. We'll leave it at that. Uh, former state representative, John Bradley, former state representative, Dan Brady and Steve Tomaszewski, longtime uh, communications guy for uh, Congressman Chimkus. Uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for the time, the input, uh, the thoughts. Uh, really appreciate your, uh, your comments on, on Southern Illinois this, this evening. So thanks, have a good guys. night guys. Yeah. Thank you. All right. That's uh, Steve Tomaszewski and, uh, uh, John Bradley and uh, Dan Brady as well uh, this evening uh, as uh, as we uh, hit the nine o'clock hour uh, here in uh, the Illinois and we are uh, so thankful that that you're with us tonight uh, around you know hundreds of you uh, joining us tonight we're we're uh, honored that that you've you've decided to to join us for for results and analysis and uh, we're we're having uh, some really good discussion with some really good people. I uh, had uh, uh, three former congressmen already this evening, a former governor of the state of Illinois, a couple of state, uh, four different state representatives, former state representatives. So we've uh, we've already brought you some uh, some people far more qualified to talk about politics than uh, than this dopey kid from downstate Illinois. So uh, we're we're really we're really glad that you're here. We're really uh, uh, glad that you're, you're you're taking time to to join us. It is uh, just after nine o'clock. Uh, wanted to uh, update you on the numbers that that we are uh, that we are compiling through through the evening uh, and, and around the state. Let's start with the congressional race uh, in the twelfth congressional district, uh, with forty three percent of precincts in. Incumbent Congressman Mike Boss leads Darren Bailey. Uh, about 18,500 to about 15,500, though, as uh, you just heard our guests talking about a few minutes ago, 
uh, that a lot of the remaining votes are left to the southeast uh, of that district, uh, which could benefit Bailey. The AP has already called the fourth congressional district race for Congressman Hayes' Chewy Garcia. He defeats Chicago Alderman Raymond Lopez. The sixth congressional district Democratic primary has also been called. Sean Caston, the incumbent uh, congressman from Downers Grove, defeats Manur Ahmad and Charles Hughes. Uh, some folks thought Ahmad might try and make a race out of this. She bought a little bit of broadcast TV in the waning days uh, of, of this campaign, uh, but Caston winning heavily. Uh, still uh, waiting for an update in the 7th Congressional District. Haven't had one in a while. Uh, Danny Davis still hanging out over 50% uh, in that race against Melissa Conyers, Irvin, and Kena Collins. In the 11th Congressional District Democratic primary, Bill Foster, the incumbent, uh, still early uh, early as we get uh, numbers in that uh, district. Foster leads Qasem Rashid. Uh, and in the 11th Congressional District Republican primary, Jerry Evans still leads early on in that race. In the Republican primary in the 17th Congressional District, uh, retired Winnebago County Judge Joe McGraw uh, has about 9,000 votes compared to about 4,500 for uh, farmer Scott Crowell uh, in, in that race to take on Congressman Eric Sorensen in November. The 19th Senate District, uh, Hillary Kurzawa, Samantha Gaska, Max Solomon, all still close. These numbers are coming in. The 20th Senate District, uh, Rossiella Guzman likely to win that race, not coming really as a surprise to anyone. Uh, it was a hotly contested, uh, really expensive race on Chicago's northwest side. Uh, Natalie Toro was an incumbent. Uh, appointed after Christina Pasione Zayas resigned last year. Uh, Guzman ran uh, the, the progressive insurgent campaign, and it looks like she's going to win that race uh, in the 20th. In the 37th Senate District, uh, former Dixon Mayor Lee Ariano continues to lead uh, Henry County Board Member Tim Yeager and Dixon City Councilman Chris Bishop uh, in that race with about 35% of precinct supporting. Uh, Patrick Joyce, the incumbent senator from the KTP area, leads big in his primary. Uh, some numbers coming in now in the 53rd Senate District primary. 31% uh, of precincts in. This one looks like it's going to be close. Uh, Chris Balkema, the Grundy County Board Chairman, has uh, 2,700 votes. Jesse Faber, the uh, high school agriculture teacher and a farmer from Pontiac. Uh, they uh, they are neck and neck, about 700 votes Uh Separate those two early on. It's still very early in the 58th Senate District primary uh, as we uh, wait for numbers back on the Bryant Cash race. In the 4th House District, as we move our attention there, uh, Lillian Jimenez looks like she's in good shape. Kimberly Dubuclay looks like she's in good shape in the 5th. Sonia Harper in the 6th looks like she's fine. Uh, Abdel Nasser Rashid is going to likely win his primary in the 21st. Angie Guerrero Cuellar, uh, heavily winning big in the 22nd. Edgar Gonzalez winning big in the 23rd. Uh, Teresa Ma winning big in the 24th. Justin Slaughter winning big in the 27th. Uh, Thaddeus Jones winning big in the 29th. And uh, in the 31st, Mary Flowers, uh, likely uh, her run in the state legislature will end. 85% of precincts supporting Michael Crawford, who has been backed by uh, more than a million dollars, probably close to $2 million now uh, from House Speaker uh, Chris Welch and his uh, his uh, uh, allies uh, have dumped a bunch of money into that race to take out Mary Flowers. who's a little bit caustic, uh, has, has had some controversy. Uh, looks like Crawford's going to uh, take out Mary Flowers uh, as, uh, as it looks like uh, Flowers run in the legislature event. Uh, Mary Gill, the appointed incumbent on the far south side of the city, uh, the Mount Greenwood area, she's sailing. Uh, the 36th House District, 93% uh, of precincts reporting. Rick Ryan still leads Sonia Khalil uh, with 57% of the vote to about 43% of the vote. Anna Billingsley uh, leads Eris Garcia in the 49th House District race, uh, still early in the 76th House District race. Uh, Cohen Barnes, mayor of DeKalb, uh, leads uh, DeKalb City Councilwoman Carolyn Zasada uh, and uh, former Lance Yednock uh, staffer Amy Murray Breel. I'm assuming with the split there, those are early numbers from DeKalb. Uh, so we'll see how 
have those come in as we see LaSalle County numbers uh, early on, uh, later on in the Republican primary in that district. Interestingly enough, the 76th is the only district, only House percentage district in the state where there were both a competitive uh, Republican and competitive Democratic primary. Uh, so Barnes currently leads the Democratic primary. Liz Bishop uh, leads the Republican primary uh, with 718 votes. Crystal Lofren's 402. Uh, early in the 79th House District, Billy Morgan leads Geneva Walters uh, as there are 10% of precincts there. Matt Hansen uh, leads Arad Boxenbaum, still early in that third House District race. Uh, Regan Deering winning big so far in the 88th House Republican uh, primary. That's to replace uh, outgoing state representative uh, Ann Calkins in the 99th House District. Kyle Moore, the former mayor of Quincy, uh, is uh, the likely replacement to outgoing uh, state representative in Greece. The goofy 102nd House District, uh, we, we're not expecting any write-in votes to be counted tonight. So uh, I, don't, I don't know that we'll even have any numbers to give you in, in this broadcast tonight as we're here uh, over the next two hours. Uh, Adam Niemerg and Jim Acklin, uh, is there in a write-in contest? Uh, nothing yet in the 105th, 107th, 110th, or 116th as we're uh, uh, waiting uh, those to be updated uh, if, uh, if uh, Eric or, uh, or or Ben can take a, take a look at those. Uh, and then in Cook County, uh, as expected, uh, not much change there in the Supreme Court race. Huge win for Joy Cunningham. Uh, the incumbent uh, there, she leads big over appellate justice, Jesse Reyes. The state's attorney race looks like it's going to continue to uh, come down to it with 91% of precincts reporting. Eileen O'Neill Burke leads Clayton Harris III, 219,000 to about 203,000. Uh, it's a 5248 district uh, difference, but still uh, some votes to come in in that race. And uh, Iris Martinez, the former state senator who is a Cook County, who is now the Cook County Circuit Clerk, uh, is trailing Mariana Sparopoulos pretty handily. Uh, 41% of precincts reporting. Uh, it's a 265,000 to 140,000 vote uh, difference in, in that race. So that's uh, that's where we stand here at uh, nine, just after uh, nine o'clock. On election night, it's uh, uh, it's it's there's still a lot of questions, still a lot of things up in the air that we're uh, we're interested in finding out uh, um, the latest uh, the latest on um, the um, yeah the 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 twelfth congressional district is. Um, it looks like it's gonna looks like it's gonna be close, um, and and you know we're still expecting to see uh, some, some numbers come in from the eastern side of that district. So uh, my guess is that that Boston Bailey race is going to uh, is going to tighten as we uh, as we come down the wire. All right, so let's uh, let's turn our attention now you know we've been spending a lot of time on southern illinois uh the last last couple of hours but uh we'll we'll move our uh move our attention a little bit uh further northward uh we are pleased to uh welcome quentin king he is a democratic strategist with strategic group and uh tom demmer a uh, former state representative and the 2022 uh republican candidate for state treasurer gentlemen good evening um good evening. quentin I'll, I'll start with you um you're, you know, you're, you're up in the, the city and suburbs. What's, what's your first impression as, as you see things tonight? I, I, I'm willing to talk about the 12th congressional district. <laughs> All right. That's exactly on par. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but that, that, that's a great race and I am watching it. Um, you know, this is, this is a, the, the um, race where we were looking at the determination to see who is, is Tony Pretwinkle as powerful as uh, everyone says she is in these last few weeks? You know, I saw a lot of uh, news stories talking about her power, and it um, uh, looks like she did a good job in the um, county clerk's race or clerk of the county um, court's race. Yeah, um, 
she it, it looks, you know, she killed it on that. But the state's attorney's race, not so much so far. That race, I guess, is still uncalled and uh, not sure where that's going to come down. If you look in the city, uh, apparently, um, uh, the um, uh, Eileen Burke is doing a pretty good job. She's holding her on in the city. As a matter of fact, I think the last numbers I looked at, she was beating him in the city where you would think that uh, Tony Prentwinkle would have a pretty strong base. But um, he, he, he's running that race. Uh, uh, Harris, you, you didn't see much on television with him. Um, Burke was on TV every, seemed like every five minutes you saw a Burke commercial. So the money uh, apparently was in the hands of Burke versus Harris. Um, the, looks like they did get some of the O's what the uh, Democratic Party is supposed to be good at. And she uh, brought in a ton of money down the stretch. And, and you're yeah. right, uh, Quentin, that she is, uh, uh, O'Neill Burke is leading in the city of Chicago. It's close. Uh, it's 118.5 to 117.8 between the two, uh, with 1,100 of about 1,300 city precincts in at this point. So, uh, Tom, I'll bring you in. Uh, the 37th Senate District uh, is your uh, your neck of the woods. Still a little early there, but Lee Ariano uh, looks like he's doing well. He's he's your former mayor uh, in Dixon. Uh, what do you see so far in that race? Well, you're right. That's been a little bit of a surprise. Uh, you know, this was a three-way race. All three candidates had uh, invested money, invested time. Uh, they were all, uh, you know, good, solid candidates with interesting backgrounds. They they put a lot into this race uh, and ran through the finish line. And it was difficult to predict, you know, how this was going to come out over the last couple of weeks. You know, a lot of people looking for what's the feeling on the ground here. And it was it was really hard to say. Uh, you know, I think what we kind of saw from these three candidates was, uh, you know, Chris Bishop was uh, knocked on a ton of doors. I mean, that was kind of what his uh, strategy was, was grassroots all the way through. Uh, Tim Yeager had some uh, a number of videos, a lot of digital media, uh, was tapping into some national issues. Uh, but I think you see, you know, Lee Arlano come out at the top there with a blend of the two, you know, both um, people knocking on the door and a, a pretty strong uh, a digital and, and paid uh, mail program. And that's probably what put him over the top here was that he had, you know, would, uh, kind of appealed to both fronts there. How do you look at, at, at the, the pickle that Republicans find themselves in Tom, that uh, with, with Donald Trump, obviously winning Illinois, he's going to be the Republican nominee uh, in November. Uh, you guys already had a, um, a drag on the ticket in 2022 that helped, help drag you down and, and, and part of the reason you, you lost your race, uh, for, for state, for statewide office, you know, you, you can compare a lot to Trump 16, Trump 20, Bailey 22, Trump 24 statewide. How do Republicans dig out of this hole statewide? Well, I think what you're seeing in a number of these local races is that there are local issues that are at play, or at least Illinois issues that are at play. So, you know, a lot gets put into, you know, what's the focus on the national uh, topic? You know, where do we stand in relation to, to Trump or to Biden in various districts here? Uh, but, you know, what we're seeing is a, is a lot more complicated than that. As we look across Republican primaries that are happening right now, uh, we have kind of a mixed bag. Um, some who you might call Trump aligned candidates are winning. Some of the Freedom Caucus members are winning. Uh, but there's also some who, um, you know, those folks challenged who are, uh, they're coming up short against those those incumbents. And so I think it's a little bit of a reminder that in a lot of cases, politics is local. Um, and even though a lot of the uh, oxygen in the room gets taken up by the national issues, there still comes down to, and you know, on the Democratic side, we're seeing this too. It's not just as simple as, you know, are you a moderate or are you a progressive? Are you a moderate Republican or a conservative Republican? There's a little bit more to that. And the results we're seeing tonight show that it's a mixed bag for, for different kinds of candidates right now. There's no one side can claim a clean sweep tonight. And Quentin, I think that that leads me to you, because I mm -hmm. think if it weren't for Republicans having uh, such an issue with 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 Trump in this state or, or even nationally, when you have the, the standard bearer of a, of a party, you know, given Vladimir Putin a big bear hug. The, the the fight of Democrats for for the soul of their party between this really firebrand progressive side and 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 what is the traditional 
you know, union Democrat uh, mm -hmm. or even, you know, even your your African-American sort of uh, a block of a voter. Um, there's a huge divide there. And we're seeing again in Chicago, the, the, the state's attorney race may be a little bit different just and that might come down to money. But you look at that 20th Senate race, I, I mm -hmm. assume that we're not tracking the bring home Chicago race. I assume it's going to uh, pass huge. Um, but it looks like progressives are winning the fight for the Democratic Party. Why is that? Um, they're organized. Um, they, they, they work in conjunction with the unions and they, they get the vote out. Uh, I think they are learning that you, you can win elections, but you got to do something more than have nice rallies and long speeches and um, hope to, and pray to win, you know, the, uh, even though they hate the old time machine, they, they haven't thrown the machine baby out with the bathwater. So they still do the, the kind of plus and minus um, routine that the, 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 the old Chicago machine does. They do door knocking. They are uh, focused like a laser beam. And when they're not, they lose. Um, when we saw uh, the seventh congressional district race with Danny Davis, um, you had Danny, who's a, you know, an, an incumbent, who's been there forever, who has a decent organization. Uh, you also saw uh, Melissa Irving, the city uh, treasurer, whose husband is also an alderman and a committeeman with a pretty strong machine in, in their ward. And then the third party, who has run twice, Keena Collins, She's a fruit of that progressive tree, which she did you know, not so well this, this go around uh, because she didn't have money and she was not as well organized as she had been in two previous races against Congressman Davis. So I think they, they, they're they learning that in order to win, you've got to do more than put some stuff in social media and hope for the best. Is Is Brandon Johnson the exception or the rule? to Chicago politics now. <laughs> I think after this next election, we're going to see he's the uh, exception. I, mean, I don't think Chicago is going to elect another Brandon Johnson in a minute. Uh, Tom, I, I think, I think the question would be downstate, you know, I mean, you've got these, these huge swap swaths of, of land where, where you're clearly going to elect Republicans like that 37th Senate district, but you know, you're, you're right around that 17th congressional district, which might be a battleground depending on the race. You've got uh, the 13th house district or congressional district, which, which could in a, in a, in a good year with a good candidate, maybe be a, 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 a competitive race, but, but it really looks like um, Republicans have almost found themselves to just become almost the, the rural Illinois party. Um, and you 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 saw it firsthand trying to gain a foothold in the suburbs. How how do you all expand that that footprint? Well, you know, first, Patrick, I, I think it's it's a great question because I think we've seen this kind of rural urban divide play out across the country. Uh, uh, you know, not just in here in Illinois, but first, I'd mention that the right now in Chicago, the the Bring Chicago Home referendum is losing fifty four forty six. Uh, with 75% of the vote in according to the AP. And so that's not a slam dunk. You know, we uh, we know how there's still a number of votes to be counted and who knows how it'll end up. But, you know, it's certainly not a slam dunk there. And I think that sets the stage a little bit for some of the items that we can talk to uh, voters across Illinois about. You know, when I ran for treasurer and, and as we have candidates, Republican candidates in uh, certain districts who are really focused on some of the fiscal issues, I think we should, you know, remember that, both the defeat of the graduated uh, income tax, which, you know, was J.B. Pritzker's signature initiative, a tremendous uh, uh, campaign run in favor of that initiative, and it was rejected soundly by voters. Uh, and what we're seeing today, again, a very uh, large progressive push to pass the Bring Chicago Home uh, uh, tax transfer tax increase. And that looks like it, right now, at least it's underwater. Uh, I think those are two really important uh, barometers that Republicans should take. You know, uh, in the legislature, I, I was not a, a flamethrower on some of the issues that folks wanted to be a flamethrower about, but I always talked about fiscal issues. And I think there are a lot of Illinoisans who are certainly not okay with just continuing to rubber stamp a tax increase, 
and to trust that, oh, hey, I'm sure they're going to do with the money what they say they're going to do with the money. The Illinoisans have a long memory and they know that there have been many, many experiences in the past where that's not been true. So I think that's an opportunity for us to re-engage. Uh, and, you know, right here, look, this is a, an initiative that's just playing in the city of Chicago, not even suburban Cook County or some of the other collar counties. This is in the city of Chicago. And so I think that's an opening for us to talk to them about fiscal issues. Can I interject What's your reaction? Something? Yeah, Can please. I, please. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the reasons Clayton Harris is probably going to lose this race is his association with the uh, progressive um, former state's attorney, Kim, uh, Kim Fox. Um, there's a sense that, you know, crime is on the rise, there's issues around, um, you know, retail theft and so forth. And I think that some of that's rubbed off on him. Um, and I've talked to quite a few African-American voters who said they, they don't feel safe. And, you know, they, they were willing to, to go elsewhere and try something different because um, the, the, the procedures and the policies of Kim Fox, um, uh, just didn't work and they still don't work. Well, I, I live in, you know, I live in the suburbs and, and, and just out here, you know, Fox got creamed four years ago, you know, mm. and, and, and this, and this is an area that the Democrats have essentially latched onto. So, I mean, there's gotta be a concern Quentin among some Democrats that, that, that you guys really have to figure out, a message that works or, or a policy that works on crime, because whether it's whether, whether the numbers back it up or not, the perception about crime in the city, especially in the suburbs is real. And that, that seems like it might be the wedge that gets Republicans back in with suburban voters, especially women. Yeah. I think it's helped in even in certain um, wards within the city of Chicago, there's you know, the old firemen police wards that, um, you know, you were crime and concern about the, you know, creeping um, issues around crime uh, has helped open doors for the Republican Party. Whether or not that uh, is sustains itself and whether or not it's significant enough to start turning down ballot elections is questionable. Where I could see it happening, frankly, before anywhere else is in the mayor's race. You know, I could I could see someone who you know self identifies as a uh, Republicans um, doing well in the mayoral race, even though you know those are nonpartisan elections. But um, yeah, well, that Paul Vallis almost sounded like a Republican he, by the he, time he did. He did. that that race ran yeah. ran down. He did. He, yeah, he came off that way. So, Tom, what's your opinion on that? Is crime the is crime the wedge for Republicans in the suburbs? Well, you know, we've heard that uh, uh, certainly in the last cycle, a major uh, focus around uh, the Republicans as a party of law and order, uh, po po Republicans as a party that are focused on crime. I still think that resonates with a certain piece of the electorate. But, you know, I think it's going to be a little bit more um, nuanced than that for Republicans or for alternative candidates to, you know, come in and, and carve out uh, a reliable electorate um, who are going to stick with, you know, candidates through multiple cycles and outside of some of the um, variations that we might see in any one specific race. Uh, crime was, you know, a, a major focus in the last election. And I don't think we saw that uh, in the results on election day. And so we need to remember that, you know, people are making decisions based on three or four of their top priorities, not just one. Uh, and so while that is one for almost everybody you talk to, it's going to be one of their top priorities. Uh, they have others. And so, you know, the question is, how well do uh, candidates line up on those others? And then I think, you know, there's also a fair question, too, as you drill down to the specific decision about voting one way or another on a race, whether it's legislative race, a countywide race, whatever it, it might be. Voters also have to ask themselves, do they think that that specific person is going to make a difference on an issue as large and complicated as safety, public safety? You know, is, do they do they feel that that's uh, a, an area where they can um, make their voice heard and make a difference on, on an issue like that? Um, it's hard to do that sometimes. And sometimes you're drilling down to such a level. You say, look, while it's one of my concerns, I don't know that if I vote for the other person for state rep, it's really going to make a lot of change. 
All right, gentlemen, we're going to have to leave this segment here. I appreciate your your time and thoughts. You're you're both welcome to stick around for our next segment if you have time. But uh, in in the meantime, we're we're uh, going to say thank you to to Quentin King and Tom Demmer, state representative. Uh, as uh, we we pull up really just really quickly our uh, our congressional races, forty three percent of uh, precincts reporting. Mike Boss leads Darren Bailey eighteen thousand five hundred to fifteen thousand five hundred. Chewy Garcia has uh, won. Sean Caston has won. Uh, Danny Davis uh, still leading uh, with over fifty percent of the vote. Uh, Bill Foster still leading. Uh, Jerry Evans still leading in the 11th district and Joe McGraw leading in the 17th district. Uh, we'll do a, a big rundown of everything here in just a few minutes, but I uh, wanted to uh, bring in our next guest who is a guy I've known for a few years, former Congressman Rodney Davis, uh, now with uh, DC Group Cozen. Uh, how you doing, man? Oh, I'm doing great. Looks like we get to <laughs> say bye-bye, baby, bye-bye to the worst gubernatorial candidate we Republicans have ever <laughs> witnessed in Illinois. Bye bye, Bailey, loser. Well, I don't know that it's I don't know that it's completely over yet. Um, you know, as as it sounded like there were still some votes to, to come in from the the eastern side of the district, but of course, Congressman Rodney Davis, who uh, served from 2013 to 2023. Uh, I worked on his first campaign in 2012. So uh, he and I go way back and uh, he still talks to me even after all these years. So uh, thankful for that and glad to have you, Congressman. Um, what is your take on how Mike Bost has positioned himself in, in this 12th congressional district race? He He has always been conservative, but he's really really embraced the Trumpy uh, in the last few years, you know, I mean, dating back to 2017 or so. Uh, is, is that a, is that a real belief or is that a, um, is, is that a, uh, a position of convenience? No, it's a real belief. I mean, Mike Bost was a, a huge Trump fan in 2016 when a lot of us had our doubts. Uh, I, I've been on Air Force One with Mike and President Trump and Marine One with Mike and President Trump, it's legitimate. And frankly, I was a little disappointed that it took President Trump uh, as long as he did to actually endorse Mike. I, I do believe it helped. I do believe it made a difference. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as somebody who, who watched Mike since he got to Congress, we've become very, very good friends. I actually miss flying back and forth with him. He's one of the funniest humans I've ever met in my life. And this guy, this guy has been doing everything he can to vote for governing in Washington. And at the same time, at the same time, being able to legitimately say, I was pro-Trump before most Republicans were. What's, uh, what's, what, I mean, listen, you, you, you had a, a bunch of Southern Illinois in, in your old district um, you know, before, before you the rematch, where you're, you can tell where you're from. There was not a bunch of Southern Illinois in there. You know, you're a heretic South of Mount Vernon for calling Madison County, Southern Illinois. But, but there was a real difference in Champaign County and, and, and Madison County. I mean, they are not the same. I mean, Only you know, bourgeois people like you, bourgeois. Are really yeah. not that much. Give me a break. Give me a break. A I'm from Iroquois County. Thing. I'm from Iroquois County, which is smaller than Christian County, pal. Uh, but, but, but you also, I mean, obviously you have Southern Illinois experience working for Shimkus too. So yes. what can you explain the transformation of, of Southern Illinois from, from the Dixie Krats to, to this Trump laden, uh, just complete, completely one-sided place? Yeah, absolutely. I, I witnessed it. I witnessed it with John Shimkus in the post-2001 remap. Remember, he had a member versus member race against Democrat David Phelps. And in the 2002 uh, member versus member matchup, uh, John Shimkus was able to carry some of the counties that were north. Uh, he was able to hold his own in counties like uh, counties like Richland County and others that back then were still represented by Democrats in the state house and Democrats at the county level and Democrats, frankly, even in Congress. But we saw the trends coming and those trends actually, uh, they came early in deep Southern Illinois. Uh, old areas that were labor Democrat areas in deep Southern Illinois really flipped towards Republicans post 2002, especially 
with George W. Bush versus John Kerry. Uh, those were, I mean, the, these were counties that hadn't voted for Republicans even during the 1994 Republican sweep. Uh, but they voted for they voted for Republicans post 04, and really it's been not nowhere looking back now. However, some of the other areas in the district that I served, Christian County, Macon County, even Madison County, uh, compared to where it is today, Champaign County is going the other way. It's becoming more of a blue county. Uh, McLean County, the same thing. But you had others that were able to that that were able to show that blue collar worker. A blue collar worker, which used to be a very strong political presence in central and southwestern Illinois, has now gone full Republican. Here's the bad part, though, for Republicans in Illinois. We're we're winning those voters, but we're losing the voters in the more populated areas like Champaign County, McLean County, even Sangamon County. And then, of course, up in suburban, suburban Chicago, too. How, how do Republicans do I, I've asked this question a couple of times tonight to, to, to folks on, on on your side of the aisle is how do Republicans balance this? Because you have the southern half of the state that is as as Trumpy as Mississippi and and you have the northern half of the state where Trump is essentially toxic. You know, you've got a, a, a gubernatorial race and a U.S. Senate race in two years that it looks like if 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 the, the Republican Party is continuing on this path. Of, of Trumpism that Republicans will not be a factor in either of those races again in two years. How do Republicans balance, can they balance Trump and be relevant? Look, I, I think long-term uh, there's a lot of hope for Republicans in Illinois. Uh, things change, trends change. I, I moved to Illinois in 1977 and until, until I was 32 years old, I never witnessed a Democratic governor. And now we've seen Democratic governors and a four-year Republican governor that I believe with a few different decisions could have been a two-termer. Uh, but he chose to make some decisions that I, I, I don't think helped him out politically. Uh, it, politics ebbs and flows. There's, there was a time in, in the 90s, and frankly, Patrick, you were there with me in 2012, and you'd have UAW workers tell me they couldn't vote for me because I'm a Republican. Well, by the end of the decade, these were the same UAW workers that reminded me when they didn't think I was Republican enough. Things can change. And we saw that in 02 in deep southern Illinois, and, and even to a smaller extent, eastern Illinois, where Democrats became Republicans, and they're not going back. The key, though, to answer your question is how do we get beyond the Trump rage in suburban Chicago and in the Collar counties? And when he is not on the ballot or he's not vying to be on the ballot, that's when I think we can start get to some issues that, that favor Republicans. And the Democrats will do exactly what they've always done. It's the same reason why Bruce Rauner got elected. They will fight with each other and screw up. But Trump's a bad dude, right? I mean, like, like, isn't that isn't that the heart of the issue here? Is is suburban voters see the kind of guy that we're talking about? The way he talks about women, the way that he has himself in tons of criminal trouble, denies that he lost the twenty twenty election, has his has his arms around Vladimir Putin. That's not the kind of guy that a moderate suburban voter is ever going to get behind, and not just Trump, but his but his party too. Right. It just it seems like a far bigger issue than, well, we're going to be fine in the off years because his name won't be in the ballot. Actually, we're, Republicans are better when he's on the ballot because he has the innate of the, the amazing ability to bring out low propensity Trump voters that vote Republican up and down the ticket. The midterms are when it's worse uh, because those low propensity Trump voters, they don't come out and you go. All you have to do is look at the results. I had the same opponent in 2018 and 2020, and it was a nail biter in 2018. And in 2020, um, it, it clearly was not. And I, I, I credit Donald Trump bringing those voters out. So look, there are a lot of people that I may like or not like in politics, but in the end, it's what the voters decide. Um, you know, I, I used to deal with people that couldn't accept that I won elections and, and that's okay. That didn't make me any less of a congressman. But in the end, uh, in the end, there's a lot of angst. There's a lot of frustration, uh, even in states like Illinois. 
that there's a two-tiered system of justice and there's nobody that plays a victim better than Donald Trump does. And uh, I don't think those, I, there are a lot more votes in than 56% in the Boston uh, Bailey race right now. We're, we're, we're getting them in as soon as we get them, but we're, uh, we're seeing a, 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 a we're seeing things tighten up, of course, as some of those uh, uh, those those votes in the eastern half of the district come in. So it's going to be an interesting night. Uh, former Congressman those are, Rodney, those, J- are, those are already in. Well, okay, I, almost all of them are already in. All right, Boston's we'll get them. In. We'll get them in, uh, and then we'll we'll get the we'll get the numbers updated as soon as we have them, and and uh, and get that get that in as well. So con- former Congressman Rodney Davis, my old boss, uh, thanks for the thanks for the time and. Uh, Appreciate the chat as always, and we'll talk to you soon. See you, bourgeois. Oh, come on, man. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Rodney. Uh, this is the guy. Imagine spending like three months on the campaign trail with that guy, uh, or six months on the campaign trail with that guy. It's uh, uh, a real, um, a real eye opener. So let's uh, let's give you a quick rundown on uh, uh, the numbers we have, and yeah, we're we're we're. Uh, we're putting them in as soon as we can get them. Uh, Boss leads Bailey with 60% of precincts reporting, uh, 29,400 to 28,700. Garcia wins, Caston wins, uh, Davis still leads, uh, Foster still leads, uh, Evans still leads, and uh, McGraw still leads in the uh, in in the congressional races. The 100% of precincts reporting in the uh, 19th Senate District. This one, it's hard to believe they're. It's really only 2100 votes in that race that uh holy low turnout in that in that 19th senate primary um that one's going to come down to absentees and 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 mail votes uh, uh as gasco leads uh, max solomon by the 17 votes 13 votes and uh hillary matzi cruzawa uh, just slightly behind uh graciela guzman going to win the seven uh, the 20, 20th Senate District, 93% of precincts reporting. Uh, she has 10,000 votes to Natalie Toro, 6,000. Uh, Lee Ariano uh, is uh, leading the uh, 37th Senate Republican primary. Uh, he leads Tim Yeager, uh, 5,600 to 4,100. Chris Bishop in third in that race. Uh, in the 53rd Senate District, 44% of precincts in. Uh, Chris Balkema has 4,600 votes. Jesse Faber has 3,300 votes uh, as uh, 44% of those are in. And uh, 70% of votes in in uh, Terry Bryant's district in Southern Illinois. Uh, she's leading huge. 70% of the vote or 70% of the vote tallied so far. Uh, she's got 12,500 to about 5,300 for Wesley Cash. Uh, in the uh, state house, Dave Severin leading big. Uh, Blaine Wilhauer leading huge with 70% of votes in. Brad Halbrook leading uh, comfortably in the 107th district. Uh, the 105th, uh, that does not look right. Looks like our, our sheet is wrong on the 105th. Kyle Moore is going to lead, uh, win the 99th. Uh, Regan Deering is going to win the 88th. Uh, and then uh, still waiting for numbers on the 83rd. Uh, and um, the 79th uh, is still close between Billy Morgan and Geneva Walters. Uh, Liz Bishop leading in the Republican primary in the 76th. Uh, Cohen Barnes and Carolyn Zasada within 40 votes of each other uh, with 35% of precincts in in the 76th House District. Hannah Billingsley going to uh, win the 49th. Uh, and it looks like uh, Rick Ryan continues to lead in the 36th House District. And of course, as we've talked about, Mary Flowers uh, likely to uh, uh, fall in the 31st House District, uh, where she has served for almost 40 years. So that's where we stand here at uh, 943 on election night. It's uh, uh, been a uh, an interesting uh, set of numbers coming in so far in a lot of these races and wanted to move to a suburban perspective. We spent a ton of time on uh, on uh, southern uh, Southern Illinois, uh, in, in this, uh, uh, in the last couple of hours, but wanted to, wanted to move to the suburbs and, uh, Scott, I lost you on camera, but, uh, hopefully we'll get you back here soon. Uh, we're, so we'll move, uh, we'll move in that direction. We are pleased to welcome, uh, Greg Hart, a uh, Republican who, 
uh, served previously on the DuPage County Board and uh, ran for DuPage County uh, Board Chairman in 2022, losing narrowly. And Scott Greider, the former chairman of the Kendall County Board, uh, who uh, ran, ran and lost a race for the 14th Congressional District in 2022. Gentlemen, good evening. Uh, Greg, let's start with you. Um, what's your takeaway from what you're seeing so far? Well, Patrick, thank you for having us. It's great to be here with uh, my friend Scott as well, and uh, really appreciate what you're doing with your webcast tonight. I've been following along on the commentary, a lot of great takes, and uh, honored to be a part of it. So obviously there's a lot of votes left to count, uh, both in some of the more high-profile races like Cook County State's Attorney and also in the Boss uh, Bailey race. But one thing that's clear to me is that the impact of an activist class in a, a low turnout election is something that can't be understated. Um, even though I believe that Boss will pull it out tonight, uh, which I think is a good thing, um, you know, Bailey certainly made this a lot closer of a race than I think people would expect. And despite a two to one money advantage, uh, even losing by 10 points shows that uh, despite the endorsement of President Trump, uh, the activist class definitely has a role uh, when it comes to a low turnout election. Um, another thing that I think is interesting is that even though um, that perspective is still applicable in Cook County with Eileen Burke uh, you know, with a slight lead, despite the activist class actually playing a pretty big role in getting Clayton Harris to where he's at, the issue of crime and public safety uh, and just frankly affordability in Chicago seems to be cutting across the partisan dynamic here. You're seeing a lot of uh, partisan Democrats, progressive Democrats voting the way they're doing um, either for the state's attorney or for the uh, the Bring Chicago Home referendum in a way that I think we haven't seen in years past. So it's certainly an interesting night. By the way, the AP has called the 17th uh, Republican primary for Joe McGraw, has called the uh, 14th Republican primary for Jim Martyr, though that was not much of a uh, much of a race. Uh, it has called uh, the 11th uh, primary, uh, the 11th congressional district for Bill Foster, uh, the Democratic primary, of course, uh, and they have called the race for uh, the 7th congressional district for Danny Davis. Uh, uh, Scott, same question for you from a suburban perspective. What what are you seeing? Hey, once again, thanks for having uh, us on the show and uh, great to be on this panel with uh, with Greg as well. Nice to see you. And uh, you know, I, I've been actually running around a little bit tonight. I've hit a couple of different uh, events. Uh, I've, I've stayed in touch with a lot of folks throughout the 14th Congressional from from last time. And um, what I'm seeing, you know, Greg mentioned the activist class, and they certainly are, are playing a role. Um, and, and, you know, what's important is that we pull them together for the fall if we're, we're going to have any kind of chance of, of winning any of these races. Um, but it seems like, um, you know, I, I'm not real surprised, I guess, by a lot of the results that, that I've seen. Um, you know, kind of the folks that I thought might win um, are winning. It, it looks like uh, that boss race is really close. Uh, really interesting too, uh, the dynamic down there. Um, and, and I don't, you know, pretend to know a lot about that district or that area, but when you see Mike Boss, who's a pretty conservative uh, congressman, um, endorsed by Donald Trump, and he's, he's, you know, kind of barely hanging on. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see uh, the impact that Darren Bailey's had on that race, um, you know, for sure. Uh, but but around here, um, you know, uh, it's interesting. You show the numbers there on the Liz Bishop. I didn't see how many, how many, um, you know, what the numbers were uh, as far as who's reported so far. Uh, that was a race that I was kind of watching. Um, LaSalle County is a, a you know a big part of the uh, the 14th, or at least the northern part of the river um, there. Um, and then the Baltimore race, uh, I know the Grundy folks pretty well um, as well. I saw it ran into former Representative Welter earlier this evening, and and a few other people from down there. So they were. Uh, looking at that race uh, pretty close too. So does that say 49%? Yeah, 49% in. Liz Bishop has uh, about 66% of the vote. Uh, and in that 53rd Senate uh, race, which uh, is uh, about 56% in, uh, Balcom has 5,900. Faber has about 40. 300. So uh, it's uh, there. There's still open questions there. But one of the things that I, I wanted to mention, because you guys talked about the the activist class. Well, well, the, clearly the progressives are going to win that 20th Senate race, which which we kind of expected because, you know, that's the most liberal Senate district in the state uh, by by numbers. CTU is engaged, et cetera. Um, but but if you look at some of these some of these big races, and I'm I'm surprised to see the the real estate real estate transfer tax losing right now, 
you know, I, I'm surprised to see Eileen O'Neill Burke pulling away a little bit in the state's attorney race with 98 percent of precincts in. She's at 230, 238 to uh, 222 as uh, as our numbers are getting updated in real time here. Uh, it, it almost looks like the opposite of what we kind of expected the night to look like. And and Greg, I'll start with you since you talked about it, that uh this we thought this would be a huge night for progressives in the city, but maybe it's not. So is that a is that a pushback on Brandon Johnson or is that a pushback on policy? I think it's more policy driven. I think what you're seeing is that we've heard discussion about public safety for the last two cycles. I dealt with it in my own race uh, out in DuPage County, where we anticipated public safety being a, a large component of what voters were going to hear about when they go into the polls. You know, I think you're seeing a dichotomy between the suburban electorate and, uh, you know, uh, folks in the city of Chicago and maybe some of the nearest suburbs of Chicago where it's actually starting to impact their lives at a, uh, a much more noticeable rate than it had even in two years before. Um, affordability is another thing. You go down to the loop and you see uh, north of 20 percent vacancy rates. You know, that's that's a new thing. and I think it's an indictment of the leadership that we've had in the city of Chicago for uh, at least the last year, certainly, you know, beyond that uh, with the Lightfoot administration and beyond that with Kim Fox. Um, so I, I do think that, uh, you know, the discussion of the activist uh, impact matters. You're seeing that in that Toro Senate race. But what you're seeing is public safety and affordability uh, are really translating, you know, progressive politics as well as moderate politics in this case in, in Cook County. Scott, I'll let you weigh in on that topic here in just a second. Mike Bost uh, declaring victory in the 12th uh, congressional district. We have 76% of precincts in. Uh, Bost leading 54-46 in that race. Uh, so he's he's declaring victory. AP has not uh, called that race as of my last check. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that here in just a second. But Scott, your, your thoughts on the, the progressive versus... Uh, uh, is it progressive versus normie fight in, in Cook okay. County at this point? Well, I think uh, did I, if I heard Rodney correctly at the end of the, your segment there, I think he said boss one or whatever, whatever he was getting on his phone. Um, it sounded like uh, uh, he was. Yeah. And we're and, and, you know, they might be, you know, they may have some different numbers coming in, but uh, we're, you know, we're just going by what we have uh, coming in. So we're uh, AP has not called it. I don't think so. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up with, with respect to Cook County and the city of Chicago. I, I have an office down at, at um, Wacker in uh, LaSalle uh, in the city. And it, it certainly the dynamic has changed. It's a conversation we have a lot uh, that, because the, the loop is just so much different. It's not as vibrant as it used to be. Um, you don't see as many, much foot traffic. You don't see as much, um, you just don't have the same vibe that you used to have in the city. And, um, you know, I travel a little bit around the Midwest. And, and one of the things that I hear is that, um, you know, a lot of people have heard about Lori Lightfoot. They uh, thought it was great that she didn't run again or, you know, that she lost and, and uh, you know, wasn't going to run again. But then they're saying, but it sounds like it's even worse now. And, um, you know, I don't know if uh, if maybe that's what a little bit of what we're seeing as well. And, um I, I didn't hear what the turnout was. Is it, it's low turnout, I assume. It's bad. In the city too. It's bad. Yeah. yeah, it's bad. And that's what we have out here. It, when I talked to the clerk earlier here in Kendall County, it was it was around fifteen percent uh, turnout, with, you know, which is just is awful low. And um, you know that that could go either way too. You know, the, the people coming out are obviously coming out because a they vote. Um, they're going to vote every time, no matter what. And b they they have some stake in it, but. We didn't have a lot of races once the uh, the presidential, um, you know, they'd already declared victory. Um, and, uh, you know, you had a couple of local races, but otherwise there wasn't a lot, you know, a lot to get it out for. All right. So I didn't bring a couple of suburban boys here to talk about Cook County or or uh, or the city of Chicago and its politics. I want to talk about the suburbs. Um, tell me why I'm wrong in the statement that Republicans are dead in in the suburbs today. Whoever wants to go first. I'll take it. Um, I'll disagree. Uh, you know, look, I think I heard Rodney Davis say that, uh, you know, the future can hold anything. He's optimistic about Republicans future in Illinois. Uh, I would say the same, but it's going to take uh, a different national brand to bring back suburban Republicans to their, their prominence. I think, you know, especially as it comes to general elections, Patrick, um, there is no such thing as a, a local race, every race, whether it's county board chairman all the way up to uh, the governor is nationalized at this point. And 
Um, like it or not, at least in the suburbs, uh, at least DuPage County, which is where I can I can speak to, um, for Republicans to have success, and I believe they will, but for them to have success, there needs to be some differentiation between them and the national Republican brand. If they aren't able to make that case and aren't able to have some separation, um, whether that's a stylistic or a policy separation, uh, I think they're going to have a very hard time swimming against the curve. That said, um, you know, in future cycles beyond 2024, depending on what happens with the presidential race, I think uh, there obviously could be opportunity and time heals all wounds. But I think right now it's going to be difficult to out, out, uh, you know, maneuver the headwinds. Should I amend that statement for your consideration, Scott, that as long as Donald Trump is the head of the Republican Party, that it's dead in the suburbs? I think that uh, there, there's a couple of things. Something that I found out, you know, um, is that, you know, the, the, the federal level is very difficult to overcome those national, you know, kind of headwinds. Um, but what we found is that they that our voters still come home, um, you know, the, the further down the ballot you go. Uh, in Kendall County, and I know uh, Greg and DuPage, you, you know, you, you guys are probably, you know, 10 or more years ahead of us in terms of um, seeing the demographic change a little bit. Uh, but for years, the, you know, tonight would have been essentially the general um, election. You know, the primary is what decided everything. And and we're not there anymore, um, which means that we can still win uh, out here. We just have to work harder. And um, I think we know that now. That's been something that, that uh, you know, it maybe took a, a while uh, for us to realize that we just kind of did things the same old way. We we anticipated, you know, we'd fight each other. We'd anticipate that uh, the Republicans would win and you'd go into the fall and you didn't really put a lot of effort into it. And uh, we know that we have to put that effort in. Um, you know, we've, we've had success in um, now, this last cycle was was pretty brutal, um, you know, from the uh, the state rep um, angle. But uh, in, in a lot of that had to do with the map. But uh, previously, we were able to to hang on to our state reps, you know, that came into the Kendall County, and then uh, you know we kept a majority of the board. We've had all countywide uh, Republicans uh, as well. Uh, so you know we're a little bit further out than you, Greg. Um, you know, but I, I think the same holds true probably in DuPage too. That uh, in a lot of the the Collar counties that uh, uh, you know we're used to in the past and now that past has been a while but uh you know the primary is was the general and uh we just we have to make sure that we're organized and uh and, and you made a really good point we have to differentiate ourselves from the national brand too um you know once we get beyond the uh you know get, get back home one one thing patrick I don't, not to interrupt you but just to Please. add to that uh, i think one you know in, in some ways it's cause for concern in other cases if you're a republican it's cause for optimism uh is the continued leftward shift of, of the Democratic Party, right? A lot of these right. suburban Democrats, at least in DuPage, that have had uh, a modicum of success over the last three or four cycles have really positioned themselves as, you know, more social liberals, but fiscally a little bit more uh, mindful, a little bit more centrist, um, all in all more moderate in terms of the Democrats. Uh, I know we've been following a few congressional primaries here in the suburbs, Bill Foster, uh, Sean Kasten, and yes, they're running away with, with massive victories, but um, in, a, in a different year, you know, someone getting 17 percent in the primary against, uh, you know, in some cases, three or four or five term incumbent. Um, it's not something to balk at, especially in a low turnout race like this. And I think what you'll see, especially as uh, more and more young people continue to move to the suburbs uh, and potentially, you know, because of the national Republican brand pick Democratic ballots, you may actually see some uh leftward shift in terms of the candidates that Democrats are putting up. I think that presents an opportunity for Republicans because even though the national like conventionalism has been focused, the Republican party has really shifted from where it had been uh, historically a little further to the right. We're seeing that same trend take place with Democrats just probably 10 years later. And I think that's going to open up opportunity because at its core, Illinois, it's uh, the Chicago suburbs, they will elect centrist uh, individuals who believe share their values. And uh, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the leftward progressive shift does not fit suburban values. And, and I think All right, that, Scott, that, I'll give you the last word here. Yeah, I appreciate appreciate that. I think Greg makes a really, really good point. As a result of that leftward shift, we're able to, to make some inroads with the, the trade unions. Uh, many of them uh, share our, our conservative values in so many ways. And uh, we, we just need to reach out a hand um, in a lot of, you know, in, in some of these uh, areas. Same thing with uh, uh, the Hispanic community. They, they, have, they share very uh, conservative values as well. And, and uh, we need to, to outreach because the farther left they go, the farther away they're going from these, uh, these key demographics. And that gives us a great opportunity, um, I think, uh, moving forward. 
And I guess before we let you go, uh, there was a specific question for Greg. Uh, I want to hear his general thoughts on his former county board colleague, uh, county board colleague DeSanti switching parties to run for recorder. Well, uh, that's a hard one for me to answer just because uh, for those that may know or do not know, he was a, a primary opponent of mine in my last race. Um, so you know, it's, it's hard for me to be independent, but I'll try to be a, as objective as possible. We have seen a lot of uh, individuals, at least in the suburbs, shift their party affiliation in recent years. And um, even though I think that's you know, a misguided choice, uh, I believe you know, Republican values better represent the suburbs than, than Democratic ones. You know, I'd have to assume that some of them have done so for principled reasons, except for PTC. Uh, I think he will go wherever he needs to go to uh, see an opportunity to get elected. And uh, I think, frankly, the answer to that question was seen tonight uh, in a Democratic primary where he ran, where he got third place. So uh, I think it's going to be difficult for individuals who think they can change their whole political brand within two years. Uh, you have to have more respect for the voters' intelligence than that. A little DuPage trash talk to wrap up our segment. Uh, former uh, uh, former uh, DuPage County Board member, uh, Greg Hart, former Kendall County Board Chairman, Scott Greider. Uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for your, your time and your thoughts. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, hope you uh, hope you guys have a good rest of your night now that we're letting you out early at 10 o'clock. Thank you, Patrick. Hey, yeah, thanks right. for having us. Thanks to Scott. Thanks to Greg for their time uh, as, as, uh, as we... Uh, uh, wrap up another uh, another hour here uh, with um, with our uh, our coverage of our election night and and uh, our numbers as they come in. I uh, wanted to uh, take a minute here to kind of update you on where we stand at the top of the hour on uh, the races that we are following. Let's start with the 12th congressional district with uh, Mike Boss, the incumbent leading Darren Bailey, 54 percent to 46 percent, 76 percent. Of, of those precincts reporting. The AP has not called that race, but Mike Bost has declared victory. The 4th Congressional District, the AP, uh, has called that race for uh, Jesus Chewy Garcia. In the 6th Congressional District, the AP also called for Sean Caston. The 7th Congressional District, Danny Davis, uh, will win. Uh, the AP has called that race for the incumbent, the 83-year-old incumbent, uh, who has 53% of the vote leading Melissa Conyers Irvin and Keena Collins in the seventh congressional district. Uh, the eleventh, a little uh, a little bit behind in our numbers, uh, but the AP has called that race uh, for Bill Foster. Uh, the uh, Republican race is still a little tight, and the AP has called the seventeenth uh, congressional district uh, Republican primary for Joe McGraw. He will take on uh, Congressman Eric Sorensen in November. In the Senate, uh, with the Republican primary in the 19th district, this is the the, the Southland, as they call it, your, your Orland Park, Frankfurt, uh, Tinley Park area. These three were face, uh, hoping to face uh, incumbent uh, Mike Hastings. Uh, it appears that Samantha Gaska has the lead, uh, not a victory. That's way too close with uh, any early and uh, absentee ballots that, that would still come in. Uh, Graciela Guzman uh, to win the 20th Senate District. She defeats Natalie Toro, the incumbent who Senate President Don Harmon spent uh, two million bucks to, to prop up. Uh, she will finish a distant second in that race. The 37th Senate District, uh, Lee Ariano, the former uh, mayor of Dixon leads with 67% of precinct supporting. Uh, he has a uh, lead of about 1,600 votes uh, over Tim Yeager, uh, a Henry County board chairman. The 40th Senate District, uh, Patrick Joyce, the incumbent, will uh, win uh, easily in that district. In the 53rd Senate District, uh, three quarters of precincts are in. Uh, Chris Balcoma, the Grundy County board chairman, uh, he is uh, he is pulling away against uh Come against uh, Pontiac High School agriculture teacher and farmer Jesse Faber. Uh, that's uh, 7,500 to 5,500 with uh, about three quarters of votes in. 75% of precincts reporting in the 58th Senate District. And Terry Bryant is cruising uh, to victory uh, against Wesley Cash, uh, who had some early money from his family and then uh, never really put together uh, much of a, a campaign uh, against Bryant. In the state house, 
Uh, we'll slide up to the top, 97% in. Lillian Jimenez, the incumbent freshman, uh, is going to defeat Kirk Ortiz, who uh, works in the Cook County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Kimberly Dubuque is going to defeat uh, Andre Smith, uh, an activist in that area. In the 6th District, Sonia Harper going to defeat Joseph Williams. In the 21st District, uh, Abdel Nasser Rashid uh, has defeated Vidal Vazquez. Uh, with 100% of uh, those precincts reporting. Uh, in the 22nd House District, Angie Guerrero Cuellar, a uh, big lead over her two opponents. Uh, same goes for the 23rd House District, where Edgar Gonzalez, who's uh, just, I think, just 25, uh, has uh, a pretty big lead in his race. The 24th House District, Teresa Ma, the incumbent, will, uh, will win re uh, will win renomination. Uh, she defeats uh, Lai Ching uh, Eng. Uh, in that uh, in that primary, incumbent Justin Slaughter wins the 27th House District uh, race. He defeats uh, Tawana Robinson, a teacher. Uh, Thaddeus Jones, the state representative in the 29th District, is also the mayor of Calumet City. He defeats Gloria White uh, at a 72% to 28% clip. In the 31st House District, with 95% of precincts reporting, uh, Michael Crawford, uh, who was backed and buoyed by uh, some $2 million from House Speaker Chris Welch and his, uh, and his, uh, uh, and, and his allies uh, to uh, defeat Mary Flowers, a nearly 40-year incumbent, uh, 7,000 to about 3,100 uh, at this point with 95% of precincts in. 35th District, uh, Mary Gill, the incumbent, uh, uh, Appointed incumbent who replaced Fran Hurley. She's up big uh, with 99% of precincts in. 93% of precincts in in the 36th House District. Rick Ryan leads Sonia Khalil. Uh, that number's been there for a little bit, 6,200 to about 4,700. Uh, in the 49th House District, Anna Billingsley leads Harris Garcia. In the 76th House District, no new updates here for a while. Cohen Barnes. Uh, leads Carolyn Zasada, the mayor of DeKalb, leads a uh, DeKalb City Council member, 1361 to 1320. Uh, 1554 to 817 in the Republican race there. Uh, Liz Bishop leads Crystal Lofgren. And uh, in the 79th House District, Billy Morgan uh, leads Jennifer Walters uh, at a 88% uh, of those votes in. Morgan has 45% of the vote. Walters has 38% of the vote. Uh, Matt Hansen continues to lead a red, uh, lead a red Boxenbaum. 76% of uh, precincts reporting in the 88th House District. Regan Deering will uh, win against Chuck Erickson, a uh, McLean County board member. Uh, Deering is the choice of outgoing Representative Dan Calkins. She's also a heiress to the uh, Andreas family of ADM fame. Kyle Moore, the uh, former mayor of... Uh, Quincy will win the 99th House District. Uh, he uh, leads Eric Snellgrove handily. Again, no numbers in the 102nd House District tonight as they're all write-ins. Uh, I'll try and have some in the newsletter for you in the morning, but it doesn't appear that we're going to see much of anything official tonight uh, in, in that race. In the 105th, uh, that uh, needs to be fixed. We've got a little uh, sheet problem there. If uh, Eric can see that. The 107th House District, uh, it looks like Brad Halbrook will win uh, with 95% of precincts reporting. I got an interesting note that Halbrook actually lost his home county uh, in the 107th, uh, that, that Marsha Webb won Shelby County, uh, which is uh, Brad, Halbrook's, uh, Brad Halbrook's home county. And in the 110th, I've got 70% of precincts in, a uh, failed effort by uh, unions take out uh, Freedom Caucus member Blaine Willauer. Uh, he, uh, he leads Matt Hall with about 79% of the vote, with 70% of precincts in, 78% of precincts in, in the 116th House District. Dave Severin uh, leads handily over Angela Evans in that district. And then in Cook County, which has been a, uh, a point of contention through the evening, uh, the uh, Supreme Court race, uh, uh, Joy Cunningham, the appointed incumbent, she replaced Andy Burke. 
Uh, she defeats Jesse Reyes in appellate court justice. Uh, that's a 75-25 split with 98% of precincts reporting in the uh, Cook County State Attorney's race. Eileen O'Neill Burke uh, leads uh, Clayton Harris III, uh, 51% to 49%, a difference of about 12,000 votes. Uh, so that one looks like it's going to probably come down to uh, mail and, and, and absentee votes uh, as they come in late uh, in, in that race. And in the Cook County Circuit Clerk race, uh, Mariana Sparopoulos leads Iris Martinez. That race has been called uh, as Sparopoulos has 65% of the vote over Martinez, who's the circuit clerk and a former uh, state uh, senator as well. Uh, I had the uh, transfer tax referendum pulled up. That is still losing, uh, which is I think a surprise to me and many others, uh, as uh, the no's lead the yeses, fifty-four percent to forty-six percent in the in the city of Chicago on uh, on that uh, bring Chicago home uh, referendum, as it had been um, as it had been dubbed by supporters. Uh, still no call from the AP on that twelfth district congressional race. Uh, between Bailey and Bost, seventy-six uh, percent of our uh, our numbers counted, uh, and Bost leads Bailey. Uh, Bost declaring victory, uh, and as uh, we we wait for the AP's number, um, but it's um, it's going to be uh, interesting to see how uh, that one shakes out in the um, uh, in, in as the last few uh, numbers come in. Uh, as I send some numbers here to our folks as they're recording the numbers that come in. Um, yeah, so it's uh, that's where we stand at uh, at uh, 10 after 10 on election night here in the Illinois. It's been uh, uh, an interesting, uh, interesting uh, night so far. Uh, lots of good perspective, lots of uh, uh, interesting folks weighing in. Um, uh, honored to have uh, Governor Edgar with us earlier. Honored to have uh, Congressman Davis, Rodney Davis, my old boss, with us as well. Uh, and uh, we'll see what uh, we'll see what happens over the next uh, next hour or so as we're uh, uh, wrapping things up and and seeing these these races uh, shake out over uh, over the um, uh, as the final numbers start to get counted in. So it's uh, it, it's. It's interesting, and I haven't seen a statewide turnout uh, number, uh, but it's not good. Um, and and you know, I think the city uh, turnout was somewhere in the. Where's that at? I've got too many sheets open. Um, yeah, so two hundred and fifty thousand Democratic votes in the city. So. Uh, lower than expected for sure. So, uh, all right, um, Latissa, I don't know which I've got two of you on my screen. I'm going to use the one where you're moving and count on that to be the one that works. Uh, so there we go. There she is. Uh, all right. We are pleased to welcome st uh, former state representative Latissa Wallace. She's uh, from Rockford and um, ran for uh, lieutenant governor a few years ago and uh, was in the uh, primary for the 17th congressional district two years ago. Uh, and then uh, former state representative Mark Batnick joins us as well. Uh, he is uh, a former uh, former representative from the Plainfield area. Uh, he left the legislature last year after uh, six terms. No. Before eight or four, eight years, four terms. Eight years, four terms. So uh, former representatives, glad to have you. Uh, two of my favorite former legislators. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate you being here. Latissa, let's start with you. Um, I, I think we kind of assumed this to be a banner night for progressives. Uh, and obviously, they're going to win the 20th Senate race in the city. But uh, losing the state's attorney's race, losing the the, the transfer tax referendum, um, you know, there's not a lot happening in the suburbs in that progressive versus uh, uh mainstream, if, if you want to go there, uh, you know, Foster and, and Kasten's opponents didn't get a lot of traction. What's your takeaway? You are muted and I can't unmute you. You're muted and I can't unmute you. There you go. 
You know I can talk, Patrick. <laughs> All right. I'm you gonna, have, I'm gonna mute yourself, Latissa, and I'll let Mark go first. Hey, um, and and Rep, it's great to see you. Oh, no, now we don't have her anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna use a Patrick term. I'm gonna put some salt in your in your coffee. I don't think <laughs> you can call the state's attorney's race yet. So with the, I'm looking at a little bit, maybe some some different numbers going straight to the websites, but the lead has shrunk. You're down to thirteen thousand boat lead um, on the numbers. Yeah, we've that, got, we've got, yeah, we've got about twelve thousand. Twelve thousand, and my understanding is, is the precincts that are out are favorable to uh, to Clayton. Plus, you toss in, you know, you're going to have some vote by mail. I don't think this is a. Um, I guess I'd probably rather be Burke than Clayton Harris at this point, but I don't think you can call that one. So I wouldn't. Oh, certainly. I, I wouldn't be uh, uh, comfortable there. I will give you some breaking. Mark, I'm not hearing you. All right, I'm going to mute you while you fix your mic situation. But yeah, let's. Uh, uh, we've got about twelve thousand vote difference in the uh, um, uh, in that in that Cook County State's Attorney's race. Uh, so we just uh, lost both our guests due to technical issues at uh, after ten o'clock at night. So uh, that's uh, usually the best sign. Uh, that that things are uh, starting to <laughs> starting to wind down. Uh, phones aren't working, computers aren't working. Everybody's tired. Uh, hopefully, we'll get both Mark and Latisa back and uh, and and have that that uh, uh, get them back in and and have a, a good chat with them uh, here in just a minute. Um, but we'll pull up some of these uh, numbers that we're at 79th district, twelfth uh, district, seventy nine percent. In Boss leads Bailey forty three percent, forty three thousand to uh, thirty eight thousand, uh, and uh, yeah, in that a uh, couple of state senate primaries, uh, Ariano seventy five percent of the uh, the vote in. Uh, he leads Tim Yeager sixty four hundred to forty eight hundred in that fifty third senate district. Uh, Chris Balkama appears to be pulling away. Uh, he's over 9,000 votes to 5,900 for Jesse Faber. And uh, Terry Bryant, the uh, state senator from Southern Illinois, she's going to win handily uh, over Wesley Cash. She's got 70% of the vote to Cash is 30%, uh, as, as with uh, three quarters of those votes in. All right, everybody's back. Um, I'm back. Rob, right. can we hear you, Rob? <laughs> We hear her. So, all right, let's let's start square one where we were three minutes ago. Uh, Latissa, not the banner night that we thought it might be for progressives. Mark, of course, is trying to 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 make the the sell that the Cook County State's Attorney's race isn't over yet. Certainly, with only a twelve thousand vote difference, it's not done. But you'd rather be Burke than Harris right now. So, so what do you okay. see as the story of the night? In terms of progressives um, this evening, it was a heartbreaking defeat, right? Uh, for me anyway, to see the Bring Chicago Home referendum um, probably heading toward defeat. Um, that has that hit hard because we understand that there's so much happening in terms of people experiencing homelessness and those who are unhoused and just a need for revenue to really begin to address that issue. So a little concerned about that one. Um, yes, the state's attorney's race, you know, look, that's been brewing for years. The, the, the conflict between public safety and constitutional policing and what communities have really voiced um, so much concern over. I think that was a, a major part of uh, Kim Fox's tenure in uh, that role. And it's playing out, I think, in this particular race right now. So maybe not the best night uh, for progressive policy or progressive thought. But I think all we can do is continue to fight the good fight. Listen, I didn't I didn't get deeply into that um, that bring Chicago home referendum just because I it, I I, I kind of thought it was a slam dunk um, that it would win, uh, even though I think it's probably bad policy. Um, Mark, as as somebody that's looked at polling on on, on those sort of issues, uh, 
any any sense of why that's going down when when maybe we didn't think it would? Well, you probably have a little bit of, of overlap with the state's attorney's race where you've had more of uh, you had more moderate voters come out for that state's attorney's race and maybe even some Republicans, traditional Republicans pull a Democratic primary ballot and decide to go ahead and vote um, in the Democratic primary. So that might have tipped, tipped the numbers a little bit. And you, you generally saw like when you saw the progressive income tax uh, did much better than like Republicans did. So there's, there are Democrats that don't, that I don't trust government spending. And when you look at the, the job that Brandon Johnson has done this, this last, uh, half year, I suppose it hasn't been the, um, hasn't been the best, but, uh, a couple, a couple of quick points. It's down to 10,000 votes now with 84% of the votes counted in the state's attorney's race. So it's continuing to tighten. So I don't, I'm, I'm not going to make totally make the sell for for the progressives, but they may come back into the state's attorney's race. I think uh, I think Guzman had a good night for the progressives. So there's uh, something certainly to say about that. So it might be a little bit more of a, of a of a mixed bag than we realize by the time it's all by the time it's all said and done. But my guess is that distrust of the Johnson administration has as much to do with with any of this. I, I'm interested in, in Brandon Johnson. Uh, and, and your take, Latisa, that that I, you know, clearly he 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 rode into office on a progressive wave uh, last year, promising to to get some big things done. He has not accomplished a lot of those things. He has uh, had some real competency problems at times. Uh, the migrant crisis has not been his best moment. Um, as as again as a progressive as as someone who who I know had high hopes for what you had seen out of him, you know, you someone more middle of the road like me looks at looks at that administration so far and thinks kind of like disaster. What? Why is that working in your mind? Is um, why aren't progressive policies really working at this point in time? Um, I think the city is really experiencing a huge shift. Um, we've lost, I, I'm no longer in the city, but I am really a Southside native. Um, there's been population loss. There has also been kind of this sentiment that has set in in many communities that their vote doesn't count. And so it is very difficult to wage such huge policy um, positions without firm uh, public support, firm support to get people out to the polls. You know, I am having a million tabs open as well. I think that's what impacted us in the beginning. You know, voter turnout is not what we would hope. And I think that is having a major impact on seeing this particular referendum come to light. And I think it's making it very difficult for the mayor of such a large city to be able to have a firm footing when, you know, the grassroots and the communities and the people are just still unsure and are not really out there pushing what it is they really want. Mark, what's your thought on that? Uh, I just think that they're just the, the group. There are certain policies that there are certain people that are incapable of even putting together, putting good policies to work. So I, I just think that Brandon Johnson was not, did not have the background to run the city. I, I, I just think he is one of the most ill-prepared mayors and, um, and it's showing, I mean, he's never ran anything big. Um, and I, I think he just wasn't ready for, for, for prime time. I mean, there's, you could certainly do a better job. I'm I, I obviously come more from the conservative end of things. Um, but you could do you you could certainly do a better job handling something like the migrant crisis, for example. Um, if you have compassion for that, you can you can promote that and handle that in a different way. You don't need to blow millions of dollars putting tents on a uh, toxic waste dump site, for example. Right? I mean, that's there was there are so many unforced errors that the Brandon Johnson administration has has already had in just a few months. I just don't think he was ready. Uh, I want to move to the 17th Congressional District. Uh, let's say so that's one that you know well. Um, Eric Sorensen is going to, if there's going to be a tight congressional race in Illinois in uh, in in November, it's going to be that one. Uh, you've got a recently retired Winnebago County judge in your neck of the woods, Joe McGraw. He's running strictly on a, a border and law and order sort of message. Um 
Sorensen, I don't think has been, I don't think he's been gangbuster in his first term. Like I think if you look at, at Nikki Budzinski in her first term compared to Eric Sorensen in his first term, uh, she's kind of running laps around him. Um, is he in trouble in November? You know, a couple of my uh, friends and I were having that conversation actually this evening. And, and we believe, unfortunately, that that might be true. Uh, look, I'm from Winnebago County where uh, Judge McGraw has uh, a tremendous amount of respect. He has a lot of supporters. I believe when he announced that he was going to take on this um, particular race, that there were over 200 people in the room that evening. Uh, so I do think that we are going to have a tough fight in November if Democrats want to be able to hold on to that seat. And I, I think your assessment is correct. Uh, the district is looking for more from Congressman Sorensen. Mark, I know you've seen some polling in some of those those sort of districts. I don't know that you guys have polled 17 exactly, but uh, but in districts like that, um, in a you know in a, a district that Trump's not going to hurt uh, a Republican like it would in the suburbs, um, I, I think the math shows you he's the most vulnerable Democrat in November. But but is it a real vulnerability? Yeah, I I, I don't know that district as well as uh, Letitia does. Uh, but um, I, I was actually surprised it wasn't closer last election to be honest with you. So mm -hmm. I think it's just going to see. It's going to depend on what the tailwinds are. I think he's certainly on the board. I think there's actually two on the board. Um, I'll see if you can guess what the other one I think that might be in play is, but I think the 17th is, is certainly one that could be in play. Um, I also think, uh, I think the 11th, um, I, I don't think uh, we, we, the Republicans ran a good campaign there last time. And I think Bill Foster's grown a little bit stale. Um, and that's near my area, and he represented part of my district last time. And I don't think that's the slam dunk that it used to be. They cut out most of his good parts and gave them to Underwood. Um, so I do think there's an opportunity in, in, in the 11th. I think there's an opportunity in both. So it looks like Jerry Evans is going to be the Republican nominee in the 11th. Uh, he, he has kind of moderated himself uh, on a couple of issues, specifically that of abortion. Uh, you know, in his run for Congress two years ago, Evans was was for a national abortion ban, has backed off that uh, this time around. I, I think that that leads us directly into that the conversation about abortion, about Roe, about, uh, you know, about the 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 Achilles heel, it seems, for Republicans who 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 for the pro-lifers and and uh I, I think there are a lot who who sort of look like the the dog that caught the car on this one um, that that they they got what they wanted then didn't know how to govern around it. Um, Democrats are going to hang this and, and and as and as often as Republicans make dumb mistakes like the IVF stuff and not being willing to come out for that. Uh, let's see. So how 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 important is this issue for Democrats in November? Look, uh, reproductive justice is always going to be an important issue. And I love that particular phrase because it is much more about the right to choose an abortion. It is about the ability to have access to reproductive health care across the spectrum. And you're correct. Policy around it has been horrible. We see what's happening in other states that don't have the protections that the state of Illinois has around um, reproductive health care and even fertility treatments uh, play out horribly. And I think that that is going to continue to be an issue. Uh, this is not a, just about being able to choose an abortion. It is about being able to have access to prenatal care, postnatal care, uh, healthy, clean communities for your child to be raised in. Those are issues that are going to continue to be on the table. And finally, you know, it's really about a right to privacy. And as long as we are willing to say that half of the U.S. population does not have right a right to privacy, it will always be a contentious campaign issue. Mark, how bad? I mean, you've seen the polling that, that abortion maybe didn't move numbers as much as we thought it would in 22 in Illinois, but it's still not a good look for, for Republicans, especially in the suburbs. 
Yeah, I think the big deal, the big thing that I would say about abortion to Republicans is they can't do the head and sand strategy like they did last time. What the polling shows is that there's pretty much the, it, we, the Democrats have done a good job of making this a binary issue, and it's not a binary issue. There's a, there's a spectrum there, and um, I'll give you an example. So uh, the teacher brought up uh, uh, you know uh, prenatal coverage. Um, blacks in Illinois suffer six times the maternal mater, maternal mortality rate versus whites in the state of in the state of illinois now my question to you is whose fault is that who, who runs the state that's number one so i don't think the democrats that have been in charge have done a good job of following what they preach number two there's things like parental notification that polls very well for republicans that for some reason they went ran away from it last election so reproductive rights shouldn't include a 14 year old who's been raped getting an abortion without the parents knowing about it or without getting an, another adult involved so you can talk about sex trafficking. You can talk about statutory rape. These are real things that happen. There's a CPS dean who uh, was caught forging the parental notification form for a student that he impregnated twice. And that form is part of what's hopefully going to put him away in jail. I don't know why Republicans run from that. There's some common sense restrictions that need to be put in place. And these are those are the sorts of things that we should be having an honest conversation about instead of you, you know running from it and just letting the seeing the entire territory and letting Dems have you know full say on everything. So I'll give you a final word on that if you want it. Yes, as a black woman who had a high risk pregnancy um, and whose son was at risk of being born with brain damage, lung damage, but is a healthy, happy young man at this point. Um, I will say that no party owns systemic racism and no party will own the solution to systemic racism. That is why black women and babies are dying. And we have to get to the root of that. And we have to work. Uh, that is an issue that we must address in the most bipartisan way and be intentional. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree. All right. Former state representative Mark Batnick, I think you're sticking around, right, Mark? Um, yeah, I got I to gotta substitute for somebody. Yeah, so, for, yeah. And then uh, Letizia, you're more than welcome to stick around, too, if you'd like. We'll also uh, have Alderman uh, Gil Vajegas join us here uh, just uh, in just a moment. But uh, May so, I say uh, one final thing? You say I, whatever you like. I really appreciate it. I want to take a second to say thank you to the Honorable Mary Flowers of the 31st District. I was going to ask you about that. I'm sorry. I know you two were close. What she has done for uh, children, for healthcare accessibility, for the notion of economic stability in communities across the South side of Chicago, what she, her, the legacy that she will leave as the longest serving legislator in the history of the Illinois General Assembly, not just black legislator, longest serving legislator, and perhaps across the country. What that means is so important. I love you, Representative Flowers, um, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you finish out this term. Um, but thank you for all that you have done for the state of Illinois. Yeah, a lot of money spent against Mary Flowers in that in that race. And hard we, to, hard to Black women are the most expensive people to beat. I've been doing the math. Someone <laughs> do that math. It's real. <laughs> All right, Letitia Wallace, thanks so much for the time. Uh, Mark, stick around. We'll, uh, we'll have you back uh, here on the other side. It is uh, 1032 here uh, in the uh, on the Illinois in our uh, uh, election night show. Uh, as we uh, cruise toward uh, 11 o'clock, we'll stick around till 11 o'clock with you. We've got another... Uh, uh, another good panel with you here uh, after our after our big update, but uh, wanted to uh, quickly run through uh, where our numbers are and um, and and see what uh, see what the latest is and uh, where we're at here at uh, ten thirty two. So, in let's start with the congressional races. Eighty one percent in uh, Mike Foss leads Darren Bailey forty one thousand four hundred to thirty nine thousand one hundred. Uh, Foss has declared victory though. Uh, at last check, the AP has not called that race. Let me do a quick refresh just to make sure. Uh, uh, AP calls the 11th for Jerry Evans. Uh, does not call the 12th. Just uh, so, uh, we'll, but uh, but Boss has uh, has declared victory in the 12th congressional district. Uh, Chewy Garcia wins in the fourth. 
Uh, Sean Caston wins in the sixth with 77% of the vote. Danny Davis wins in the seventh. He gets 53% of the vote in a five-way primary. He defeats Melissa Conyers Irvin and Tina Collins. In the 11th Congressional District, Bill Foster uh, is well on his way to uh, winning renomination. He leads Kathleen Rashid, uh, 32,000 to uh, As we mentioned, the AP has called uh, Jerry Evans in the 11th as well. And uh, the AP called the 17th for Joe McGraw uh, over Scott Crowell. In the State Senate, uh, again, a small number in the 19th District. Uh, that's not a good sign for Republicans in November. That one's going to uh, probably be decided by late arriving mail and absentee ballots. 20th District, Graciela Guzman defeats Natalie Toro uh, with 100% of precinct supporting. She got just under 50%. Had a few people uh, uh, suggest to me that Guzman would hit 50, and she just just under it. Uh, Natalie Toro will finish second. Uh, there was a concern among some Senate Democrats that Toro would finish third, but uh, she'll finish a distant second in that race. In the uh, 37th Senate District, 98% of precinct supporting, uh, Lee Ariano, the former uh, mayor of Dixon, uh, who uh, is of Mexican heritage, uh, has 48% of the vote. He's likely to win over Tim Yeager, uh, who has uh, Henry County board member with 5,600 votes. 40th Senate District, uh, Patrick Joyce, winning big. Uh, 53rd Senate District, uh, Chris Balcoma, uh, 90% of precinct 10. Balcom is going to win that race with just under 10,000 votes. Just in favor, just under 7,000 votes. And in the 58th Senate District, Terry Bryant, the incumbent, uh, winning big uh, over Westwood Cash, uh, who uh, ran a, uh, a not great campaign in uh, in Southern Illinois after he had gotten a bunch of uh, a bunch of money uh, early on in that race. Uh, he did not capitalize. In the House, uh, we'll slide up on our sheet here. Lillian Jimenez wins uh, the 4th District primary. Kimberly Dubuque wins the 5th District primary. Uh, Sonia Harper wins the 6th District primary. Abdul Nasser Rashid wins the 21st House District primary. Angela Guerrero Cuellar wins the 22nd House District primary. Edgar Gonzalez wins the 23rd House District primary. Teresa Ma wins the 24th District. Justin Slaughter wins the 27th district. Uh, Thaddeus Jones wins the 29th district. These are all incumbents. Uh, and then, as we mentioned with Latisa Wallace, that uh, Mary Flowers, uh, the longest serving House Democrat, she uh, she will lose her seat to Michael Crawford, who was backed by a bunch of cash from House Speaker Chris Welch and his allies. 95% reporting uh, Crawford has 7,000 votes to about 3,000 flowers. Uh, appointed incumbent Mary Gill wins big in the 35th uh, with 100% uh, of uh, precinct supporting in the 36th House District. Uh, Rick Ryan uh, looks like he'll defeat Sonia Khalil, 6,700 to about 5,000. Uh, Ryan was backed by outgoing uh, State Representative uh, Kelly Burke. Uh, in the 49th House Republican primary, Hannah Billingsley uh, will take on Maura Hershauer in the uh, 49th district in the 76th uh, district, 86% of precincts reporting. This one is uh, as tight as you can imagine. Uh, DeKalb Mayor Colin Barnes has 1751. DeKalb, uh, DeKalb City Councilwoman Carolyn Sada has 1722. And uh, Lance Yednock, uh, former legislative aide, uh, Amy Murray Briel, uh, just behind with 1654. That's with 86% of those precincts reporting. It looks like Liz Bishop, the House Republicans chosen candidate, will win that primary. Uh, so she awaits the winner of that Democratic primary uh, in November. In the 79th House District, 88% uh, of precincts reporting. Former Pat Quinn aide Billy Morgan still leads over Kankakee School Superintendent Janita Walters. Uh, in the 83rd uh, House District, incumbent Matt Hansen wins. Uh, over a progressive activist or at Rex Boxenbaum. Uh, in the 88th House District, Regan Deering will win that race uh, over Chuck Erickson from McLean County uh, with about 69% of the vote. Kyle Moore, the former mayor of Quincy, uh, he wins the 99th House District with 6,200 votes. Uh, 
and uh, Eric Stelgrove, his opponent, got about 2,300 votes. Uh, no numbers to give you tonight in the 102nd House District. Uh, they they are all uh, running a little a little behind because they're all write-in votes in the really goofy district that we've talked about previously. Uh, I might try to I might be able to have a little bit in the newsletter tomorrow, but uh, not uh, not a guarantee by any means that, that we'll be able to have those. In the 105th district, uh, the number is still not quite right. Uh, Dennis Gifford, uh, we're pretty sure, is leading, but uh, our sheet's not showing that correctly. Brad Halbrook wins the 107th. Uh, Blaine Willauer wins the 110th. And Dave Severin wins the 116th House District. Joy Cunningham wins big in the Supreme Court race in Cook County. Uh, she gets almost 75% of the vote over appellate court justice Jesse Reyes. Uh, in the Cook County State's Attorney's race, no change from our last set of numbers. Eileen O'Neill Burke has about 238,000 to about 226,000 for Clayton Harris III. And Mariana Sparopoulos wins the Cook County Circuit Clerk race uh, over Iris Martinez uh, with uh, about 290,000 votes to about 156,000 votes uh, at this hour. So that's where we stand as uh, we're at 1040. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to go till 11 tonight, uh, and, uh, and then we'll have plenty more in the newsletter tomorrow and, and a lot more to talk about over the, the next, uh, next couple of days. But, uh, I, I think we've got a pretty good sense at this point of where things are going and what's going to be close and, and what's not. But, uh, we do have one, uh, more group that, uh, we are excited to bring in and, uh, Hey, that Batnick guy looks familiar. Uh, Mark Batnick is back, and uh, we are pleased to welcome Chicago Alderman Gil Biegas, uh to uh, to the program as well. Alderman, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, since we just heard from Mark for the last uh, twenty minutes, let's let's hear from you. What's your big takeaway so far tonight? Well, I think what we're seeing uh, as relates the two big races that were in Chicago uh, were the state's attorney's race as well as the referendum question around uh, Bring Home Chicago, which would, would have allowed um, the real estate transfer tax uh, to, to be raised on properties above a million dollars and then be lowered uh, on properties below a million dollars. And there was some challenges um, at the appellate court and then upheld by the, by the uh, Supreme Court, um, but uh, it looks like it's going to be defeated. Um, unless the 109,000 outstanding votes here in Cook County um, can come in and and, uh, and turn that around. But it looks like it's going to be defeated here. Mark, what's what's your take on on that referendum? I mean, I haven't I haven't spent a ton of time on it. I'm surprised by it because I, I assumed it would pass. Um, wh what's your take on, on why it why it's failing? Well, I think I, 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 let's look at this more broadly. If, if I would think that a Burke voter would be a no, um, and then a few Harris voters would be a no, and the rest of the Harris voters would be would be a yes on it. If you want to look back at, it. I would think that the referendum would do a little bit worse than kind of the the state's attorney makeup. Maybe that's just you know being out. We did not pull that particular one. We obviously pulled the state's attorney, and we had it at a dead heat, which is it keeps getting closer. Um, and I, I, we talked about it before. I just think it's it's a hard sell to ask people to pass a tax with this particular administration and the and the stumbles that they've had out of the gate so far. Well, I don't know if you had an opportunity to see the see the referendum question. Uh, it's like half a page long. No, I'm I'm a suburban voter, so I didn't see it. Well, here here it's like half a page long, uh, and so confusing, and so. If you can imagine, voters are probably, look, if it says tax in there, uh, I'm a no. And I, I, I think that um, what you saw where the BOMA and the, the real estate folks were successful in putting forward a lot of attention around it and then ran some campaigns up here in Chicago that that really took a look and hit uh, Mayor Johnson, uh, who's polling, you know, between 20 and 25 percent and just really attached the referendum question to the mayor saying, do you how do you feel about the mayor's job now? And do you want to give him more money to spend? Uh, and people were just overwhelmingly, uh, well, not overwhelmingly, but by a majority, 54 to 46 right now, saying no, that they don't trust the administration with these with these new funds. And they haven't been spelled out. They have, it hasn't been spelled out as to how it's going to be spent. You know, there was a, a, a the General Assembly had, had uh, and the governor had put 
about 350 million uh, to, to deal with homelessness. And we don't know what the city's share is gonna be. Uh, and then we also have been spending money to deal with this issue. But like I've told people before, this is not an issue that we can solve a city alone. We gotta figure out how to county, how to state, as well as the federal government can help deal with this issue. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the voters of uh, the voters of Chicago around this referendum uh, do not trust this administration with additional revenue. And, and Mark, we talked about that in the previous segment that that it just feels like, while while and and Alderman, I'd love your your perspective on this that that while while the mayor was swept in on this this wave of progressive goodwill. I don't know whether that was he's the alternative to what people thought was a Republican in Paul Vallis uh, by the end of that campaign. Uh, it, it's it's one thing I used the I used the dog caught the car analogy for Republicans and abortion. It almost feels that way for progressives at this point that that they they came into power and then didn't know how to handle it. And and it's hard to not look at the first almost year of the Johnson administration from an outside perspective. And think this hasn't been a bit of a disaster. Um, how much, how how little trust is there? Do you think uh, for the Johnson administration in the city? Well, I, I think I think that the way you had analyzed it was, was right on. Uh, what you saw was the uh, Chicago Teachers Union and the and the socialists um, were successful in painting Paul Vallis as, as a Republican, and quite frankly. He didn't do himself any, any favors uh, by some of the by, by some of the uh, comments that he made in the past. So in essence, what you had in Chicago was a Democrat versus a Republican. And as you can imagine, Chicago is a very Democratic city. But the fact that a Republican, quote unquote, Paul Vallis, received 48, 49 percent of the vote really told you how uh, how how under um, uh, how uh, how um, underwhelming uh, Johnson's campaign was because he he should have. You know, at running against a, a Republican in the city of Chicago, he should have overwhelmingly got 60, even 65 percent. But that just says that. Um, and then the turnout was very low uh, on the older voters. Uh, what we saw in the runoff, we saw the younger voters a lot more motivated um, and um, and, the, and the older voters stay home on, this, on the runoff. Listen, um, pragmatic progressive is something that I am someone who likes to get things done understanding that incremental wins are our wins. What you're seeing now is, is in the Democratic Party, just like in the Republican Party, you've got the extremists, uh, both in the socialists as well as the, the MAGA folks that are, are coming out and bringing their voters out. And what you saw in the, um, what you saw in the mayor's race is that he was able to successfully bring out his base of socialists um, and, and progressives in order to get the, in order to, to beat Paul Vallis. Um, but it's, it's just mind boggling that public people talk about public safety as a big issue in the city of Chicago. They say if you poll that question, it gets 60, 70 percent are concerned about that issue. Well, ladies and gentlemen, public safety was on the ballot in the mayor's race and it was on the ballot tonight for the state's attorney's race. And we had a whopping 35 percent come out for the mayor's race and 20, 22 percent come out for the state's attorney's race. So then I have to ask myself, is public safety a big issue? Because you should have seen you should have seen a mad dash to the polls for people to cast their votes for whatever side they want to be on. But it's just frustrating that people are not participating in, in, in the in these elections. And, and Mark, I wonder if that's maybe a, a mistake by Burke's campaign, because she I mean, Kim Fox got her butt kicked in a lot of suburban areas that are voting for Democrats for president. U.S. Senate, Congress, legislature, and, and, and you know, it seemed like Burke could have played really well in the suburban areas that, and and maybe she did fine, but but there was no real presence for her out here. And I'm just on the other side of city limits. Did, did they make a mistake here? Well, this, and we talked about this on, on a different show and the fact that we got to remember, this is a Democratic primary. If this was a nonpartisan general election, I think Burke wins this this going away. And I have to start by saying, I think the, the alderman and I would have had some, some great um, policy discussions. I consider myself a pragmatic conservative that wants to really come up with policies that solve the problem. For me, it's all about let's really analyze the problem and, and, and how do we solve it. And right, let me pour, let me pour the whiskey for everybody and we'll just we'll, <laughs> we'll start we'll start making some bills. 
Well, what, but what, what you're seeing is, and I, I would, be, would be interested to get his feedback, is you're seeing a lot of governing by slogan, and that doesn't work, right? The, they, they say you, um, you, you, you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose, and there's not a lot of prose going on. There's not a lot of people that actually want to look and analyze uh, problems and come up with solutions. And, you, you know, sometimes you Republicans probably more, more than likely want to look at ways of spending the money more efficiently and and democrats want to look at a problem and they want to spend more money but they probably should want to do it efficiently as well um everybody should want to spend money efficiently and i think that sometimes those sorts of things get those sorts of things get lost so um i agree with him on on a lot of what he said about what you're getting on the extremes in both sides and uh it's you know they're probably i am surprised at the lack of turnout but we have to remember it was a Democratic primary. Biden's the presumptive nominee. It's a Republican primary with Trump the presumptive nominee. When you look at what usually drives people out to the polls, it's a uh, um, it's the presidential race, and it there's just there was nothing to look for there. And and speaking of the presidential race, Alderman, uh, you are a Biden delegate. Uh, you were essentially unopposed, so congratulations. You're going just down the street to uh, to the United Center for the convention. Uh, but we've talked tonight a little bit about Biden's uh, issues with, um, uh, you know, with with the, with his poll numbers, uh, even within his own party. Obviously, some progressives are upset over over his support for Israel. Uh, you know, I think there are a lot of folks. I, I think I would be uh, in that in that group that thought, all right, he's 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 not Donald Trump, so that's a good thing. Uh, but but it hasn't been a great first term for him. And then there's the age issue. Um, what What's your take on Biden's poll struggles as we move move forward here? Yeah, so um, I also um, am part of uh, an organization called the National League of Cities. And it's the like an umbrella group of municipal leagues throughout the country. And so we represent, you know, thousands of municipalities, towns and villages. And we're just celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. And we were fortunate to have the president in Washington, D.C. address the conference. And he started off by saying, congratulations, National League of Cities, on your 100th anniversary. And I can attest that I was not at the first meeting. Uh, and I think that he's really you know, talking about the, the one issue that uh, Republicans are trying to, to talk about, about the age. Um, and so if you take a look at about what his administration has been able to accomplish uh, in in the first term. Uh, we're talking about the you know the 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 uh, the um, bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, 1.2 trillion, uh, the Chips Act, uh, the IRA. I mean, these are big things that are going to be huge, and we haven't even seen them come to fruition yet. Uh, with with the Capitol bill, the 1.2 trillion, a lot of things things are still in design. You saw Congressman uh, from Colorado talk about putting forward 250 billion for high-speed rail across the country. Um, you know, th that's another thing that the administration is taking a look at: um, reducing um, medicine for for seniors, uh, specifically uh, around diabetes. I mean, there's a lot of things this administration has done. The problem with the Democrats have been that they have not been talking about this a lot more. The president hasn't been talking about these accomplishments and is just starting to talk about them now. Uh, I think uh, Mark had mentioned about, we were talking about abortion earlier and taking a look at Ohio and Kansas, what transpired uh, around those state, uh, those state uh, constitutions around, around, uh, um, around uh, abortion, you're going to see that play out. And I think that as much as uh, former President Trump was talking about what he, how he was able to eliminate Roe v. Wade through the through the through the uh, uh, Supreme Court. I think that that's going to come back to bite them. And all all President Biden has to do is just keep talking about his accomplishments on the under under the Bipartisan Act, the CHIPS Act, bringing manufacturing back to the United States uh, and the Reduction Act, Inflation Reduction Act. I think those are winning. Those are winning policies that have been passed and put forward. And we're just starting to see the benefits of those of those policies. Mark, to button up the, the Biden issue, uh, is is his 
Is his age a big, big issue in the suburbs? Do you think? I mean, obviously Illinois is one thing, but but you've got suburbs of Milwaukee, suburbs of Detroit, suburbs of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh that are going to be essential in winning a presidential race. We're not going to get into that in an Illinois race, but 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 clearly that could have some impact here in Illinois as well with legislative and congressional races. Oh, sure. It's going to make a big impact in the suburbs. I mean, even though we don't have a chance, uh, Republicans aren't going to win the presidential election anytime soon. People still go out to vote in presidential elections and they're driven um, and they have coattails, especially in a place like a suburb and in a swing district. When we do polling, what we see is inflation and immigration are the number one and number two issue. Um, I know they passed the Inflation Reduction Act that was really a green energy act and the trillions that was thrown out into the economy has really caused pretty significant inflation. That's what we're seeing from voters. And I think that that's the reason why you see Biden's poll numbers as bad as they are, is he hasn't addressed the immigration issue and he hasn't addressed the, in, you know, the inflation issue. While he passed something that was called the Inflation Reduction Act, um, people aren't seeing it when they go to the grocery store, when they buy a house, when they pay rent, when they go to the pump, all those sorts of things. So uh, it's, you know, it could be a pocketbook and border, border election. Before we wrap things up, uh, Alderman, I've got the screen stopped on the 20th Senate District primary. Um, pardon me for not having my Alderman map mapped out with the uh, Senate map in my head, so I don't know how close you are uh, to it. But um, this was a, a race where Natalie Toro, who was uh, uh, appointed uh, to replace Christina Paciani Zayas, uh, had a ton of money spent on her behalf. Um, were you at all surprised by the outcome of this race? Um, it was funny. Be, it was funny because folks had met, talked to me and were asking me, does a low turnout help the incumbent? And I explained to them that in this race here, there isn't an incumbent. Uh, we had a uh, Senator Toro who was appointed. I happened to be one of the committee men that voted for Toro uh, because what we've been seeing in Washington, D.C. around the extremes on both sides and really Congress not doing anything, I don't want to see it trickle into the General Assembly where, 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 we're gonna, where we could potentially find ourselves with all this bickering and nothing getting done. I tell, I tell the, progressive all the progressives all the time that when we're talking about progressive policies, the first eight letters of progressive is progress. Like, let's get things done. Let's talk about getting incremental wins. Let's, you know, if I get 20, 30 percent of something that I'm trying to get accomplished, then that's a win. Then, then I just keep moving forward in the next year and trying to get another 20, 30%. But what you saw in this race with a low turnout, you saw the, the, the progressives and the socialists able to bring out their base. And despite the fact uh, almost $2 million being spent on Natalie Toro's, Toro's behalf, there wasn't, there wasn't that, 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 that energy there in order to bring out the more pragmatic progressives or the moderates the true, the, you know, the blue dog Democrats that are in this area that are that are concerned about about the about uh, inflation, that are concerned about um, you know uh, education, that are concerned about uh, public safety. Those folks stayed home, and so what you saw was the the far left having the ability to bring out their base, and uh, and as a result of that, you see that uh, Graciela Guzman. Uh, is going to be the senator from the 20th district. Uh, Mark, I, I know you were in the House, not the Senate, uh, but you've sat in a caucus meeting in Springfield plenty of times. Will there be some grumbling among Senate Democrats that that Harmon spent so much money on on a, a loser of a candidate? Oh, absolutely not. A hundred percent, I don't think so. I think Harmon comes out with his caucus members, which is the most important thing, looking like he defends incumbents. Um, he, they spent to the end, they probably knew that she wasn't going to win, but he ran through the tape and it's not like he's lacking for money. Um, I, they might have mm -hmm. a defense kind of, sorta this upcoming election. So I think if I'm a caucus member, um, if I'm sitting in the caucus, let's say it was the situation was my caucus and the Republican. And I saw one of my, one of my allies that just got appointed and my leader just went all out for him to win and he lost. I wouldn't put that on the leader, right? I would put that on. I would put that on the candidate and the electorate and the type of district that it is. So I think Harmon, um, and I'd be interested to hear the alderman's take on this. I think Harmon, with this caucus members, actually looks 
looks like he he did all he could. You can't always win, but you can always, you know, do everything you can to try to win. So I think I think Harmon's going to be more than fine with this caucus members. What do you think, Alderman? I, I think that's a I think that's a correct statement. Um, the Senate president uh, is defending uh, an incumbent, um, although she was not an incumbent. She was appointed. She was, you know, he was protecting her. But, but I also think I think that, you know, the, the Senate president sees how some of the policies in the Democratic Party are moving and has some concerns and wants to get some more pragmatic folks there. Uh, what we don't want what we don't want to see is the gridlock that's going on in Washington, D.C., coming to the General Assembly, or quite frankly, to anybody, any any legislative body. You know, we want to get things done. And we can have these disagreements, but at the end of the day, we got to make sure we're serving the people that we represent. All right, gentlemen, we are about out of time. Mark, I wanted to, you know, I think we've been we've been doing our Festivus airing of grievances uh, on, on this show for the better part of four hours. So uh, let's let's finish with some positive. Uh, from a Republican perspective, give me a positive uh, leaving leaving the, the the situation tonight. Oh, I think the, the biggest positive is is that it looks like pretty much all the incumbents won. Um, so you, you know you had some attacks with with Severin and, and Bryant. Um, obviously, it's not the same dynamic with um, uh, quite the same dynamic with Will Auer and uh, Adam Niemer, who, by the way, I'm getting reports that he's probably going to win easy. At least that's what their team thinks. Um, so hopefully there'll be a little bit of a healing period. Tip sword wins easy. Um, so I'd say the biggest the biggest positive for Republicans is that it's kind of at least a push. Um, not too much upsetting of the apple cart happen on the Republican side. Uh, the, the last, you know, we'll have to see what happens with Boss Bailey. That'll be that'll be an interesting one because we're down to about five thousand votes. A little bit more than five thousand there are few small counties that haven't reported anything that are in Bailey territory, but I just looked up their population there relative. The two counties total about 17,000 people. So that one will probably even tighten up a little bit more. Um, but that's what I would say would be the positive for, uh, for Republicans. And Alderman from the democratic perspective. Well, you know what, uh, Biden won with 91%. So we're excited that, uh, he's there. There's a lot of great, there's a lot of great policies. Um, that uh, we, we were able to accomplish in the first term. We just got to do a better job of amplifying it. Um, as, as you know, the inflation is coming down, um, we just needed to, to come down quicker. I, I, will, I will agree with Mark that the, the, the border issue is, is, a, is a concern. Um, but I think that, you know, the president had worked with the, the senator uh, to try to bring some type of um, bill forward. But unfortunately, uh, former President Trump um, did not allow it to, to, to come for a vote in the House. Um, and so it, the problem that I have with, with, with those types of scenarios is that we're talking about people's lives here. We're talking about people that are coming uh, across the border, fleeing uh, war-torn areas in some cases. Um, but we, we got to get that border under control. And I think that the policies that were put forward by the president were good, were good, was a good start. But unfortunately, uh, former President Trump uh, you know, was able to get to Speaker Johnson to block it. Former uh, Representative Mark Batnick and uh, Alderman uh, Gil Vijegas. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for the the, the time and the conversation. Uh, Alderman, we hadn't talked before uh, until today, and I'm, I'm glad to get to know you and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. I Alderman, I, would, I, I would have liked to discuss some policy with you. I just have that feeling we would have had some long, boring discussions, but uh, well, hope to run across you again. Well, Mark, Mark, just so you know, I, I worked in state government for almost 10 years. I was a, a deputy director at IDOT and a chief of staff at CDB. So I understand how government works and sometimes doesn't work. And so as a legislator, I, I like to get things done. So more people who make government work, please. Thank uh, you. Gentlemen, thanks so much. Have a great night. See ya. All right. It is uh, 11.02, and uh, that's uh, that's going to be the end of our conversations for tonight. We're going to uh, do a quick rundown of our uh, numbers as we have them at the 11 o'clock hour. Uh, not everything is settled at this point, uh, but we are getting down that road um, as, uh, as, as we wrap up. So 85% of precincts in in the 12th congressional district. Uh, Mike Foss uh, continues to lead Darren Bailey. Uh, I have a 2,000 vote difference, so uh, we're we're not uh, totally done here yet. Uh, and uh, Boss uh, has declared victory, but the AP has not called that race yet. 
fourth congressional district incumbent, Jesus Chuy Garcia. The AP has called the race for him. 69% of the vote over Alderman Ray Lopez. Uh, Sean Caston, the incumbent in the sixth district, gets 77% of the vote uh, with 99% of precincts reporting. 86% of precincts in uh, in the south. Seventh congressional district, Danny Davis will win re-election. Uh, he has 53% of the vote. Uh, I should say he will win nomination, but there's no real Republican in that race, and it's not a competitive uh, general election anyway. So, it, for all intents and purposes, uh, Danny Davis will win re-election. Bill Foster, 77% of the vote in his primary tonight. Jerry Evans declared the winner by the AP in the Republican primary. So it'll be Evans versus Foster in November. And it will be McGraw versus Sorensen in the 17th Congressional District as the recently retired Winnebago County judge uh, defeats Farmer Scott Crowell in that 17th District Republican primary. As you mentioned, the 19th Senate District, uh, small number of votes, close. We'll see how that one shakes out over the next couple of weeks. In the 20th District, Graciela Guzman defeats Natalie Toro, uh, 11,000 votes to about 6,600 votes. Dave Nyack finishes a distant third. In the 37th uh, Senate District, uh, it appears Lee Ariano uh, will uh, win that race. He has 8,500 votes to Tim Yeager's 6,100 votes. And uh, in the 40th Senate District, incumbent Patrick Joyce had nominal opposition. He's going to sail uh, in that race as well. In the 53rd Senate District, Chris Balcoma, uh, the Grundy County Board Chairman, has uh, 10,200 votes to Jesse Faber's about 7,000 or 6,800 votes. Uh, so Balcoma, uh, who will will represent the 53rd district, as there's no Democrat on the ballot in November in that race. In the 58th Senate district, Terry Bryant, she wins re-election easily, uh, renomination easily, 70% uh, of the vote to Wesley Cashman's 30% uh, of the vote. In the State House of Representatives, Lillian Jimenez wins big. Kim Dubuque wins big. Sonia Harper wins big. Abdul Nasser Rashid wins big. Uh, these are all incumbents. Angie Guerrero Cuellar wins big. Uh, Edgar Gonzalez wins big uh, in the 23rd district. 24th district, Teresa Ma wins over uh, Lai Ching Eng. In the 27th house district, Justin Slaughter wins a huge race, a uh, huge win over his opponent. Thaddeus Jones with a big win as well in the 29th district. Mary Flowers, the uh, longest serving member of the legislature, uh, defeated in her primary tonight uh, by Michael Crawford, uh, 7,000 votes to about 3,100 votes. Incumbent Mary Gill, uh, appointed incumbent Mary Gill, wins handily in the 35th district. Rick Ryan wins the 36th district uh, over Sonia Khalil. Ryan was uh, the choice of outgoing Representative Kelly Burke. Anna Billingsley, the Republican that will face uh, Representative Maura Hershauer in November in the 49th House District. The 76th House District, uh, this is the dumbbell from, uh, from uh, DeKalb down to LaSalle County. Uh, this one close, and I'm being told uh, DeKalb County has not finished reporting, so that 76 is not done tonight, uh, at least not yet. Cohen Barnes, uh, had the mayor of DeKalb, has 1,751 votes. Carolyn Zasada, a DeKalb County board member, or a DeKalb City Council member, has 1,752 votes. So that's the difference of just 19. Uh, and Amy Murray Briel has 1,654 votes. All the numbers are starting to like blend in in your eyes at Point, uh, of the night. Uh, and Liz Bishop will win the Republican race, so she'll take on the winner of uh, that primary in November. In the 79th House District, Billy Morgan uh, leads Geneva Walters uh, with 88% of the precincts in. Matt Hansen wins his primary in 83. Regan Deering will replace Dan Calkins in the 88th. She wins big uh, in that primary. Kyle Moore, the former mayor of Quincy, he's likely headed to the House. He uh, defeats Eric Snellgrove. 73% of the vote. Uh, the 102nd House uh, Republican primary, uh, I, I, I've only seen one county, and it's, it's not good for Ackland. Uh, Adam Niemerg uh, is doing well there, uh, but those numbers won't be counted for a few days. Uh, we finally, have our 105th uh, page fixed. Uh, Dennis Tipthard wins uh, handily in his race. Brett Halbrook wins the 107th House District, though 
uh, it, it sounds like he lost his home county uh, to uh, Marsha Webb, uh, which potentially means some problems on the home front moving forward. Blaine Willauer wins big against IEA back in that hall. And Dave Severin uh, wins a challenge uh, on the right against Angela Evans. He gets almost 70% of the vote tonight. Cook County, Joy Cunningham, the uh, Supreme Court Justice, has 75% of the vote in her race against appellate Court Justice uh, Jesse Reyes. 99% of precincts reporting in the Cook County State's Attorney's race. It's now a 10,000 vote race uh, between Eileen O'Neill Burke and Clayton Harris III. So that one will not be finished tonight. And uh, and in the Cook County Circuit Clerk race, uh, Mariana Skoropoulos uh, wins handily. Told that that 76 just got an update. Let me give that to you before we uh, sign off for the night. Uh, LaSalle County just dumped a big batch of ballots, putting Amy Murray Briel in first place. Uh, so she's been trailing all night. She got some uh, home cooking in LaSalle County and with 89% of the uh, precincts in uh, in the 76, Amy Murray Briel takes the lead by about 300 votes over Colin Barnes and Carolyn Sada. We'll stay up with that one tonight, talk to all three of those candidates, and have something for you in the newsletter. Uh, in, in tomorrow, it's still tomorrow morning, right? Yeah, it's only 11 o'clock. So I wanted to just take a minute before we, we sign off for the night. We've been uh, live now for about four hours and ten minutes, so uh, we'll 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 let you all uh, get about your lives here soon. But uh, I, I just I wanted to thank you all for uh, for your support of, of what we do with our newsletter, with our website, with our uh, with our uh, with our with our web content, like like a live cast like this and our podcast. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. We couldn't do it without our subscribers. We couldn't do it without the support that we get from so many of you. And uh, we, we've had a really great number of, of people watching tonight. And I've had uh, great comments via email and text messages and, and, and some comments here on the, uh, the broadcast as well. And it's really, uh, it's really heartening because we, we took on this, this project to do this show a little differently uh, than a lot of places do it and, and bring on a bunch of different perspectives and, and, and wondering, well, is anyone going to watch this? And, you know, you have, and that means a lot to us and, and, and we're very thankful. So thank you to all of our guests tonight. Uh, Congressman Bill Enyart, uh, Republican uh, strategist Colin Corbett, uh, Congressman John Shimkus, former Congresswoman Sherry Bustos, uh, former State Representative Denise Wang Stoneback, former Governor Jim Edgar, uh, former State Representative Dan Brady, former State Representative John Bradley, uh, former Shimka spokesman Steve Tomaszewski, who's a Southern Illinois politico, former State Representative Tom Demmer, uh, Democratic strategist Quentin King, uh, former DuPage County board member Greg Hart, former Kendall County board chairman uh, Scott Greider, former State Representative Mark Batnick, former State Representative Letissa Wallace, and uh, Chicago Alderman Gil Vijegas. They they all uh, joined us through the night, and I thought he played, uh, gave a lot of great perspective from a lot of different sides of the political spectrum uh, and, and a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, um, a diversity as well in, in thought and, 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 and demographics uh, too. Uh, and, and thanks to the group that has been uh, doing all the hard work tonight. Uh, it's, it's, it, you, you'd be hard pressed to understand that, um, how many numbers and how much work went into this and how deeply unqualified I am to work with the people that I've been working with tonight. Uh, there were two Emmy nominated former TV reporters, uh, working on, on, getting these races in for you tonight. So uh, thanks to Ben Garbrick. Uh, thanks to, to Katie Hines, my boo, uh, for, for helping uh, so much uh, and, and uh, all of their work. And also thanks to data wizard, uh, Eric Swenson uh, for, for everything you guys did to, to help us tonight uh, get some good information out to, uh, to voters, listeners, watchers, and, and all of those. So uh, thank you all so much. Uh, have a great night. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost over uh, as, as some of these numbers come in, uh, and, but we'll get everything sorted out by morning and we'll have a new edition of the newsletter for you uh, tomorrow at theillinois.com. Everybody have a, a great night. Thanks so much for joining us and we will talk to you soon.